You're on. Five-year-old Tigger has been hit by a car. His morning walk nearly ending in tragedy. And what injuries have you noticed on him? Well, it's his leg. We were going to the park, um, going along Daly Road, and there was a street cleaner on the footpath. He got really spooked. Then he just moved backwards and slipped his collar straight into the road, got clipped by a car. So once he was hit, he scurried off and oh, just disappeared? Oh, 100 miles an hour. Yeah. It was unbelievable. It happened so quickly. It was two hours before a search party found Tigger hiding terrified in bushes. And it was such a relief because, you know, I hadn't been able to breathe. I can't believe that someone who'd get hurt could run like that. It's almost tragic, but in that awful moment, Tigger's ultimately run away from the one person that was there to help him, which is Bernadette. When I was listening to his heart, it is doing a few abnormal things. It's just, it is jumping all over the place in terms of its rhythm. And his oxygenation level there is 89. It, it should be over about 96. And that's usually what happens with shock. Shock is when they, they're just not getting the oxygen to their muscles and to the organs that they need. I'm giving Tigger two injections. The first one is to try to reverse the effects of shock. So the oxygen's coming back up fresh a little bit. The second one is pain relief. Right now, Tigger, in this state, must be going through hell. you up. At SASH, eye specialist Callie Caruso is finishing her rounds before she heads off to Coffs Harbour for a very special operation. I'm going to work on a fur seal. No way! Yeah, we're going to take a cataract out and hopefully give her oh some vision. Goodness, that's it's, awesome! Yeah, it's really exciting. I'm just a little bit jealous that Kelly gets to operate on a fur seal. I mean, they are one of my favourite animals and to restore the sight on one of them, that would be amazing. I'm going to get to work with my old mentor, Carmen Collitz, which... Seriously? Yeah. I've heard she's awesome. She's awesome. <gasps> Carmen Collitz is the guru when it comes to cataract surgery in marine animals. She travels around the world doing these sorts of operations. If we weren't so busy here, I would just tag along with Kelly. <laughs> yes. Fingers crossed the surgery goes well. And who knows, it's probably going to need a follow-up visit and maybe I'll do that. We'll do right side down, so we'll get a bit of shoulder in as well. Back at Bondi, Chris is now x-raying road accident victim Tigger to find out the extent of his injuries. X-ray! When you're dealing with the sort of forces that you are in a car accident, normally the bones, they shatter. The moment I see those x-rays, it's clear there is a break there, but it's a hairline fracture. And amazingly, it's a very clean fracture. Instead of the fragments of the bone being on top of one another, they're perfectly aligned. That's pretty rare. I'm totally blown away. He has run for two hours, so much so that he's worn the skin off the pads of his feet on a broken leg. It just shows you how much fear was running through his body at that time and adrenaline. It's an amazing effort. I thought it was broken when I first saw him and I wasn't sure what other injuries he had, like internal injuries, but they've come out pretty lucky. I think we can get away with this with just a splint. Okay. Look at you, a wounded soldier. In many respects, the splint is easy for me to put on. It's probably easy for Tigger. Tigger doesn't have to go through a major surgery. But for Bernadette, it actually means more work. We've still got six weeks of really intense care ahead of us to make sure that this fracture actually heals. He'll get the hang of it. Yeah, that, that's good. Cool. Here's the bits I always hate. Watching those first few steps, you're just hoping that cast stays on. So far, so good. Could be back any minute, though. Let's give him a round of applause for that. Thank you, audience. Sash Eye Specialist Kelly Caruso has arrived at the Pet Porpoise Pool in Coffs Harbour. Thank you very much, Rob. The show is on, but her patient, 15-year-old girl, is sidelined. See, she's not really sure where we are, though. No. She's kind of having a look around. She knows we're here somewhere. Big round of applause for Pearlie then. Just a short time ago, this old stager was one of the major stars. It's really, really sad for us to see. You know, Pearlie used to be very, very outgoing, energetic seal, loves swimming around in our show, interacting with people. 
Yeah, well. She's, you know, one of my favourite seals, to the point where we've got now where she can't really do much except float around in the pool. She's always worried about bumping into things or tripping over. Bet you wish you could see us. As a two-year-old, Pearl was rescued after a fishing hook blinded her right eye. Come on, girl, a little bit further, what's the step? In the oh, last month, a cataract has robbed the New Zealand fur seal of the sight in her left eye. She doesn't even have a pupil, it's just slammed shut. And on top of that, I can just get a hint behind there of the cataract. She's really scared. I was hoping we wouldn't see such a bad cataract, but it's blinding her. So the only option is to surgically take it out. If the cataract isn't removed, Pearl will be permanently blind. But putting a fur seal under anaesthetic is high risk. All the team are aware when we do put Pearly under that she may not wake up, but we've all ultimately decided that we want the best life for Pearly we can possibly provide her. So we want to help her out and we want to get her eyesight back so that she can see and be happy once again. How he normally is, what change have you noticed? In the last hour and a half, I've just been going out and checking on him and he just stopped moving. At the Bondi Clinic, Penny has arrived with the distressed Albert. A large tick was found on him yesterday afternoon, but today the pug has suddenly become lethargic. The moment any dog's rushed in with a tick, the first thing I, I really do is listen for their breathing, because the breathing tells you a lot. When that breathing's coming from a pug though, how do you know? Every pug sounds like it is suffering from severe tick paralysis. His heart sounds like a dog that's, that's stressed really because of the fact that it's hot, plus he's, he's having this toxin float around his body that does interfere with his breathing. It, it also affects how well his heart can pump. It's not good. Oh, well, it's not great. No. Okay. No. And you've gone over him looking for another one? That was the original. Yeah. I think that there are a couple here. There, is that one? It's a, it's a nipple. <laughs> oh, sorry, Alps. He's got four of those on either side. <laughs> If they were ticks, we were all in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I've had people convinced that lumps, that cysts, that even pimples are ticks. Nipples, though, yeah, that's a first. This one, it's certainly been a paralysis tick because I can see that its mouth is actually still in there, that little spike. And that little reaction he's got around the area is, is his body trying to send antibodies out to, to try to get rid of the, the tick. OK. Um, so that's obviously been a decent size one there. Penny's feeling guilty. She didn't bring Elba to Chris earlier. Yeah, I've been feeling really angry at myself all day, so I, I just hope he's all right. What I wouldn't mind doing now is actually putting him on the ground and seeing how he walks around, because the way the tick toxin works, it hits him in the back legs first, and then it starts to work its way up the body and affect the breathing. <laughs> Look, he looks okay, but what I wouldn't mind doing is actually keeping him in. Okay. And let's just watch him, let's let him cool down, let's let him rest and just see how he looks then. Because if he suddenly starts to worsen then he's, he could get bad quickly. Really quickly yeah. because of the, of the pug things. Yeah. Right yeah. Well, He's a wonderful family pet. Well, has. It's not going to be a good couple of hours. I'm just delighted that I brought him in when I did. It's a big day for you, girl. Oh, you so know something's up, don't you? In Coffs Harbour, sash eye expert Kelly Caruso is performing a final check on First Seal Pearl. She's off to hospital for crucial cataract surgery to hopefully restore her eyesight. Getting the lens out of there is delicate. Lily! But the biggest thing we're concerned about with a lot of these seals is that they can die under anesthesia and that's the scariest part. We've just got the ET tube in, um, which is an airway down the throat, and now we can breathe for her. Fantastic. That'll work? Mm-hmm. Perfect. Sure. All right. So we're good. An elite team from the United States is standing by at the hospital. Yep. yep. Kelly will be assisting chief surgeon and her mentor from America, Carmen Collitz. Are you ready? You're ready, okay. Just getting ready to enter the eye. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and make the incision. 
Seals have very tight pupils, so you have to work pretty hard to open them up. Okay. Every minute under anesthesia is touch and go for Pearl. Come on, Pearly, you can do it. With her worried friends looking on, there's huge pressure on the surgical team to get the operation done as quickly as possible. There's obviously a huge emotional attachment between the trainers and the animals. Plus, you know, Pearly's kind of a sentimental favourite. So, fingers crossed for her. Oh my God. been on the operating table for more than an hour. It's a little bit nerve-wracking there. But at last, it appears surgeon Carmen Collitz is ready to remove the cataract that has robbed the 15-year-old fur seal of her sight. Oh my goodness gracious, look at that. There she is. That's the cataract, that's the lens. Is it a girl or a boy? It's a boy. Got it. Well done. Ah, oh, pearly. Time to suture. Mission accomplished. But the relief is short-lived, and the team's worst fears are now being realised. Pearl is not regaining consciousness. Is this the scariest part, waking her up? Yeah, I just want to get her to stop breathing on her own again. Okay. Come on, Pearl. Come on, Pearly. At Bondi, Chris is still monitoring paralysis tick victim Albert. When she's pulled it out, she's left the mouthpiece in there. Okay. This little tick mouth tube, it seems so insignificant, but it's what sucks the blood out of Albert. It's also what injects the toxin into him. The worrying thing about what Penny's told me is that she's pulled this tick off Albie, but since then he's got worse. That makes me worry that he could actually have other ticks on him. If that's the case, multiple ticks can cause big problems. I reckon the easiest thing to do with him is just to spray him. Yeah, to be safe. Yeah. Are you enjoying this? The thing is that they can really lull you into a false sense of security. The tick toxin is still being absorbed into his body and it can get a lot worse over the next 24 hours for him. So I have to watch him. If he gets worse, he could get worse quickly and then he'll need the tick serum. Yeah, he's just getting tight. Think about it. You stay there. It's been about 45 minutes since surgery finished and she still isn't taking fantastic breaths on her own. Restoring the sight of a fur seal has been a dream for sash eye specialist Callie Caruso. But now the dream is turning into a nightmare as the much-loved Pearl struggles to wake up after the removal of her cataract. Come on, wakey, wakey. So we got her this far. A few more minutes. Is that her opening yeah. her mouth? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. 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 Finally, she takes a breath. When she took that breath, thank God, we were all just <gasps> could breathe ourselves. I mean, it was just um, a magical moment. <laughs> Good luck to you, okay? You beautiful girl. One, two, three. It will be several hours before the team knows whether the operation has been a success. But Kelly is hopeful. The first cataract that you remove in an animal and they wake up and they look around and they wonder what happened, it's the most amazing feeling as, as the person that removed the cataract. I think Pearl is going to have that same feeling. All of a sudden her world is, is light again. She's going to see things like she used to but didn't remember. So I think she's going to be pretty excited. <laughs> Carm, thanks so much for letting me come and do oh, this. Oh, golly. Awesome. Oh. So, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Really cool. If he can support all his weight in his back legs, then he's doing all right. At Bondi, paralysis tick victim Albert has amazed Chris with his remarkable recovery. That core strength? Been working out. Hmm? The plan was for overnight observation, but in just five hours, the lucky pug has fought off all signs of the tick toxin. For Albert to come in with suspected serious tick paralysis and then walk out of here in the same day, 
That's quite an achievement. How long is it going to take? Should be very long. Penny and her two daughters, Stella and Pip, <laughs> are anxious to take their best mate home. Alright, so he's looking good. Fantastic. Albert really shows you that every single tick case is so completely different and unpredictable. You can have a tiny tick that absolutely floors a dog and could even kill it. <laughs> then you have a big sucker on Albert that seemingly causes next to no signs. It just shows you have to be so careful. The delight the girls had in having Albert back in the family was pretty clear to see. It's obvious that Albert is important for his emotional value, but also his humour value too. Good boy, Albie. Time to go home. Let's get him home. Bye. So excited to see Pearl. I hope she's well. I'm here on holidays with my husband, Brad, and I said to him that I'm just dying to pop in and see Pearl, see how she's recovered after the surgery. I just can't wait to meet her. Good girl. It's been two months since Pearl's operation. Her eyesight is back, and so is her confidence. Hello, Pearl. When I saw her see me, it was amazing. Oh, butterfly kisses. She's happy <laughs> and she's in good spirits. <laughs> oh, darling, thank you. The eye actually looks fantastic. I mean, you can see that she's got vision in it, she's interacting, it's not swollen, it's healed up beautifully. I know she's a vet pal, but come on up, just give her a nice big hug there. Ah! Oh. She's back in action, she's performing tricks, and I'm so glad that it's worked out that way. There you go, Pearl. I knew you had it in you, she's still got it. Big round of applause for Pearlie there. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I look at her, it brings tears to my eyes. Honestly, it is one of the most touching experiences of my life. <laughs> you ready for this? Tigger, Tigger, here, Tigger. He's not a good fetcher, he just likes to run for it. <laughs> ready. As for Tigger, after a long rehab, he's back playing his favourite game. Now bring it back. He's <laughs> got a mind of his own, he always has. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> always got to get into trouble in the first place, really, wasn't <laughs> it? It's been three months since the five-year-old was hit by a car and limped out of the clinic with a broken leg. Troy, Troy's going to go. Looking pretty good. He's absolutely delighted to be well now and running in the park. Yeah, it's great. Bring it back. You've got to remember that Tigger is a male dog and like a lot of males, it's all about the thrill of the chase. Once he has what he's after, <laughs> the whole excitement of it seems to disappear. Where's the ball? Where's the ball? A patient with a bizarre condition is on his way to see Chris. Hey! How you going, Neil? Yeah, I'm good, Neil. His bemused owner, Lee, Hello. was a vet nurse Dude, at the Bondi Ziggy. Clinic. Ziggy. Oh, what we got happening here? Yeah. Well, he's got a, got a little something growing on his leg here. Wow. It's like almost, it sounds a bit funny, but like a third testicle swinging in the wind there. It's just so big. It's uh, definitely one of the strangest things I've ever seen. People were just standing at the lights going, what the hell is that? <laughs> Makes you feel like a neglectful dad. Ziggy, come on, this way, boy. Come on, let's go. What the hell is that? This is a little something that's uh, been growing for a bit over a year, I think. A year? Yeah. How can you...? Well, you know, it, it started off a little small and then what? just got, just kind of escalated a lot. And suddenly, since it's, it's got a lot bigger recently, the weight of it's... It's gotten a lot bigger, yeah, you can see the, the sheer volume. <laughs> I'm trying to be serious and maintain my professional integrity and all the while I'm just thinking, well, look at that thing. What is it? It is like a chihuahua speedball, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. You could start at your own chihuahua gym and sit there just going... It is almost comical, but it, it could have a very serious side to it. You can actually see he has actually been banging in on things. Does he seem in pain with it? Does he ever yelp out with it? No, it doesn't. He never, never ever complains at all. While it looks like a cricket ball in a stocking, it feels like it's full of fluid, which to me is quite reassuring, because if it was just a mass of tissue, I'd be quite worried. The very real risk here is that that lump 
could actually get caught on something when Ziggy's walking past it. That'd be nasty. It's probably not going to surprise you too much when I say to you, this has to come off. Yeah, I was, I was actually hoping, hoping it would. I'll open it up once I've taken it off and, and have a quick look. Mm -hmm. But I guess the hope is that it isn't anything too serious. Okay. okay. Oh, Camera crew are caught up in traffic chaos. No! Mother Duck and her babies have taken a tragic wrong turn. People are just stopping, cars are stopping, there's people jumping out of their cars and just scrambling around the cars trying to catch these little ducklings. Be careful, mate. In a panic, the mother duck flies off, abandoning her ducklings. One right under your car here. Now orphaned, it's imperative the chicks are caught and brought to safety. Jeez, oh, one just went under a car. Oh, it's out the other side, I think. Go out that side. Jeez, so quick. Oh, this is crazy. Right now, legs on this up. The Good Samaritan couple are now taking nine ducklings to the nearby Sash Hospital. Sadly, there has already been one casualty. No, one got run over. What do you reckon about that, Liesl? Um, I've seen them bigger. They get me bigger than that. <laughs> well, maybe not on dogs. Can't say that on TV, can I? The gigantic mass hanging off Ziggy's back leg Doesn't needs to be like removed for his safety. I've seen plenty of lumps that have taken my breath away in terms of how big they are. But I've never seen one that could trip the dog over. It's, it's extraordinary. There is a risk that this is a tumour, but the way tumours, certainly nasty tumours, normally behave is that they invade into the body. This one is making a drastic attempt to get as far away from the body as possible. Mm. This is interesting. We've got the big vein coming along here, and it disappears once it hits this lump here, and then reappears after it. It's quite possible that whole lump is actually a blood vessel that, that's had a massive blowout and just continued to expand. And as more blood has come into it, it's got bigger and heavier and just started to drop, drop off the body. Mm. This might actually be a little bit more tricky than we thought. And the worry I've got now is that we've got a major blood vessel that I have to cut through and around. You get that wrong and it's going to be bloody mess. You can really see that vein now. Chris has begun removing an enormous mass from Ziggy's leg. The problem is he has to navigate around a major blood vessel. I'm getting through a few small ones, but sort of the elephant in the room is that big vein that's still hanging out there. I'm just going to leave that to last. Anything this big is always going to have a really good blood supply, so if I even nick the big one, you guys will know about it. After an hour, Chris is becoming more confident the vein that was causing so much concern may not be attached to the cyst. So I think I can actually get the lump off without even having to cut into the vein, which is a bit of a blessing. There it is. Honestly, I'm actually quite relieved that operation's over because it was a lot more touch and go than I thought it would be. People are watching, <laughs> waiting. Samples of the mass will be sent to the lab to make sure it's not cancerous. Ziggy, meanwhile, will be staying at the clinic for a sleepover. You wait until you see what I've done to you. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. Are you ready to go to bed? It looks like you could sleep it off. Yeah, that's what I thought. So 
there's nine birds. One of them was hit by the car. If you could just come up and, and have a look, please, that would be appreciated. After a frantic rescue mission, Alicia and David have just arrived at Sash with the nine orphan ducklings. One other chick died on the motorway. Oh, I love animals, it's hard. Definitely. Hi, little guys. Look at you. Emergency vet Lisa Chimes now needs to check over the babies for any serious injuries. So remarkable that this couple stopped their car in the middle of a freeway, jumped out and tried to rescue these little ducklings. I mean, they could have endangered their own lives. We couldn't have left them there. We wouldn't have forgiven ourselves if we did. I'm looking for signs of head trauma, feeling their limbs and seeing if they've got any breaks in their wings and their bones. I mean, if these ducks are so tiny and so fragile that if they came into contact with a tyre or a car or anything on that freeway, they would not have stood a chance. No, you did good. Look at them, nine out of ten. And it's thanks to you. I think it's um, an amazing effort. Thank you so much. Come on, little guys. Thank you. We don't actually get ducks here very often, so I've raided the fridge and stolen someone's lettuce for their lunch. This is service. I don't even cook like this for myself. Chopped it up finely, soaked it in water, and that's what they're going to get until I can find some proper duck food. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Oh, my God. I've asked the nurses here if they can look after the ducks, but the hospital's full, we're busy, been told Lisa, take them home, keep them warm and bring them back alive tomorrow. No pressure. Freeway, at this time, you're going to be strapped in. At Sash, huh? Lisa's shift is over, but the real work's just about to begin. She's on her way home to play foster mum to nine lucky ducklings. You'll be good in the car, little duckies. The chicks were rescued from a motorway after their mum had left them to fend for themselves. Hello. Hi. Look what I've got. They're staying for the night. What the? In the bathroom. Hi. It's a big surprise for Lisa's husband, Brad, and their four-legged family, Nelson and Lucas. Nice to the baby duck. Love him. The dogs got one look at the cage. I let them meet their new brothers and sisters. And then Nelson licked his lips and that was it. The boys are staying here. Wait there, wait. Just wait, just wait. We'll come back to you in a second. I don't want to stress the ducks out too much, so the dogs have been banished and they are not happy. He loves you. Yes. Oh, my goodness, uh. Brad. I don't know if Brad's cut out to be a father just yet. He's not coping very well. How many of these he are there? Loves you. We've got nine babies, Brad. Lisa. What? They've gone under the sink. Yeah. Don't know if this is so good for the marriage. Brad, what are you doing? You're meant to be watching them. There they come. No, 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 no. Not oh. on the bed. Go to bed. Everyone to bed. Come on, kids. In you go. Bedtime! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Bedtime! They'll be all right, Brad. Don't worry. They'll be okay. No. I need you to come and have a look at Hugo. He's our male Galapagos tortoise and he's just coming into his sexual peak. How old is he? He's 61. <laughs> He's 61. Next day, Chris has arrived at the Australian Reptile Park to help out with a special investigation. He's never had a girlfriend. Never. Never. We have to get him a girlfriend. It's one hell of a drought. Well, he has to pass this test. What, what test? Well, we need to know if he can make babies. Fertility test. Mm. In a tortoise. In a tortoise. <laughs> Galapagos tortoises are pretty rare. In captivity and in the wild, for that matter. Um, but. To get him a girlfriend, we may have to go international. And you wouldn't want to do that if you could uh, find out in advance that he wasn't able to make babies. Hugo's been looking for love in all the wrong places. He's fallen for a goose called Lenny. And he's also crazy about his keeper, Julie. Yeah, at the moment he thinks that I'm his girlfriend, so um, 
which is, it's, it's nice, I suppose. It's a bit flattering, but <laughs> uh, at the same time, it'd be really nice for him to actually have his own real girlfriend. With no female tortoise in sight, Hugo's a frustrated bachelor. All of the rocks within his yard that even slightly resemble the, the shape and size of a female Galapagos tortoise, he's been a bit naughty with them. You're a good looking man here, you go, aren't you? You've got that sort of dignified, but you look. He thinks you're a rock. He's pretty frustrated. I, I mean, I think he needs a female. You've almost got to feel sorry for him. It's pretty cut and dry today. If he isn't fertile, if he can't be a dad, then there's no girlfriend, ever. I think there's a sound. Oh, quick, get it. Yeah, mate, in you go. You serious? You got it? Yeah. Enough? Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. Put that under the microscope. Let's see if they wiggle. So, mission accomplished. Future generations of you guys really are going to be decided by what's in this jar. And also his happiness. I'm actually a bit nervous. <laughs> well, I've got my fingers crossed. It's um, a lot riding on this. So I'm a little bit sad. My little family's going. It was fun while it lasted, hey buddies? Lisa's nine orphans have made it through the night. Hi. Hi. Now she's reluctantly handing Hi, them over Lisa. to the experts. We're lucky we've got some babies in care at the moment with an adult. Okay. So we'll just add them to the brood. I think there'll be 19 babies with one adult. You're cute. Oh, that's how you thank me. <laughs> hey? Surrogate mums, they can't count. Another nine ducklings, no problem. All right. Good Thanks luck. very much, Lisa. Let me know what happens with them. Absolutely, and we'll be in touch. Maybe when we release them. Hopefully. Okay. Take care. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. I'm actually looking forward to a good night's sleep tonight. Yeah, good luck to him. Oh, the expectant father, Timmy. Yeah, I'm nervous for him. At the Australian Reptile Park, Chris is putting Hugo's baby-making abilities under the microscope. What I'm looking for in this sample is, first of all, that there are sperm in there but secondly, that those sperm are able to move, that they're swimming strongly. If they're doing that, and if there are enough of them, then Hugo's classified as being fertile, and it can be a dad. We're moving here. Little Hugo's. They are? And so they're trying to get somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> they're little guys in a hurry. And they're Hugo's little guys in a hurry. Yeah, I'm so happy for him. <laughs> Hugo, you get your girl, mate. <laughs> Good times coming up, Hugo. Now Tim has to get busy on the internet to find out just what suitable candidates are out there. I don't think he's going to be too fussy about which girl turns up, but it's very important that they are unrelated to Hugo. So they're managed by a stud book, and that says which girls regionally or internationally are most suitable for Hugo, and they will be the girls that come. We won't tell her at the rock either. That's our little secret. That might scare her off a bit, actually. Later that day, Ziggy's trying to give Chris a message. Hey, Zig. You're missing something, aren't you? Yeah, you are. You're missing your little mate. That massive cyst has gone. The new improved Ziggy is ready to be reunited with Lee. Hey, Ziggy! He's come through really well. Fantastic. Not only do you get Ziggy home, you actually get... Oh, you did keep it for me? The very special gift that you were requesting. Fantastic. So, Oh, that's disgusting. As for the biopsy results, they're all clear. People are going to stop staring at him. I'll stop being embarrassed. He'll probably stop being a bit embarrassed as well, which is good. Good for his confidence. <laughs> I can't wait for you to see them, Lisa. Yeah. They've I grown so much. Can't wait to see them as well. And wow, what a spot for their new home, huh? Lisa has caught up yep. with Neil from the rescue group Wyatt's to say goodbye to the baby she took in eight weeks ago. They don't look much like babies anymore, Liz. Well, they're ready to go. I've definitely stirred the pot here. 
I've been thinking about these little guys for the last few months, wondering how they're doing, and I'm so excited to see how big they've grown and to hopefully set them free in the water where they belong. Here we go! Oh my goodness. Oh, look at That's that. That's amazing. It's beautiful. Wow. <laughs> We've got some candidates that he can have a look at. That's where you got the laptop. Yep. You're matchmaking online. Yeah. Man. You serious? Yep. Well, we can show him. Here you go. It's been several weeks since Hugo's fertility look on here. was confirmed. Look. Tim's been searching far and wide for a suitable mate. This is Shelley, she's 52 years old, oh, and we believe that she's looking for love. Ooh. Ooh. She's very Thanks, son. I was just looking for love, too. She likes too. long walks along the beach and moonlight cinemas. She's never had a boyfriend in her life. And we think that she would be perfect for you. So now we begin negotiating and we get Hugo, his girlfriend. Could take a, a little while because these things, you know, take a while in the process, but what a day. If they could see you now, You'd be getting nothing, I promise you. Oh, you go, settle down. In the meantime, it's only the best food, only the best conditions, and we get him looking handsome for her arrival. You imagine when Hugo sees her, she needs to be warned. <laughs> I'm on my way up to Newcastle to see the family, but before I get up there, I really wanted to make a special stop off. I got a letter from a girl called Jess, who's got a dog who's not even two years old yet, called Boris. He's had some really serious troubles. She sounds pretty desperate, so I'm really hoping I can help out in some way. You <laughs> <laughs> big guys. We're getting to know each other, are we? Huh? Boris was born with a cleft palate, a genetic deformity which leaves a dangerous hole between the roof of the mouth and the softer palate behind it. Is it true? Are you a tough guy? You've had to be a tough guy, haven't you? Puppies born with this affliction are normally euthanized immediately. That's exactly what would have happened to Boris if vet nurse Jess Warby hadn't stepped in. It was quite stressful. Um, a lot of us didn't know if he would survive. We had to put a tube into his stomach every two hours to inject milk to feed him, and it was touch and go. Okay, it's okay. Yeah. He would have had quite a few infections, I'd imagine, yeah, along the way. Yeah, he gets them quite regularly. Just definitely. from the food pushing up into his nasal cavity yeah. and carrying bugs. In his short life, Boris has endured seven operations. He's had ear cartilage harvested to try and fix a hole that didn't work. Um, he's had a plate fashioned, like holes drilled in his gums, and that also didn't work. Oh, well, wow. OK. If I don't do anything, he will get to the point where he'll, he'll just be very sick and, yeah, it'll be time for him not to be with us any longer, which is really scary for me. Good boy. Good boy. Chris will Good now boy. arrange for Jess and Boris to meet with surgeon Andrew Marchewski at SASH. So basically, you're my last hope. It's no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Amazing day, isn't it? Two days after returning from his trip to Newcastle, Chris is called out by the lifeguards on patrol at Bondi Beach. What's down here? Yeah, it's just down there. Harry's is watching it. We've had a yellow belly sea snake wash up on Bondi Beach. Oh, I'm surprised it hasn't had a lash at him, actually. <laughs> oh, probably might do the work for it, yeah. I think everyone's yeah, been trying to get rid of yeah, Harry's Yeah, here. Harry's, yeah, he's, he's definitely uh, section eight at the best of times. <laughs> Moving, baby. See, the snake's moving, so he's well and truly alive. <laughs> yeah, we've got the right man for the job. Brownie's coming down shortly, so just stand by. What are you doing, Harry's? He's <laughs> <laughs> an idiot! <laughs> Is it a cobra? No, it's not a cobra, it's a sea snake. Are you sure? I know he's saying it's a sea snake, but uh, you know, th th this is my domain down here. <laughs> I'm the lifeguard, I know what's in the sea. He's a vet. I'm dealing with a cobra. It's floated in from India. What is going on inside your head? Well, I, I don't know what the protocol is to deal with snakes, so I'm thinking if I get some snake charming music. You got the flu. I'd love to say seeing Harry's dressed up as an Indian snake charmer surprises me. 
but no, this guy is clinically insane. <laughs> Have people been walking past yeah, no, the Yeah, no, people have jumped over it. At Bondi Beach, Chris has been called out by the lifeguards to rescue a maroon sea snake. In a way, because it's such an awful day, it's been a blessing for the locals. Thousands of people run on this beach every morning, and one of them was going to step on him. This snake could bite them, and if he bit them, they'd be fighting for their life. They've got quite small fangs. Yep. But they still have a really incredibly toxic venom. I mean, it's, it's meant to be one of the most potent toxins in the whole animal world. Really? So they will bite if, if people really threaten them. Yeah. The reason he's come ashore is because he's normally out at sea and he just wouldn't have the strength to fight against the, the current. So he's just been blown ashore and that's why he's so exhausted. There's only one man that can handle the job and it's Chris Brown. Here we go, he's coming up now. Yeah. Don't look at me like that. I did nothing. Oh, he's, he's looking at you. He's, <laughs> and he may make a bit of a rush towards you there. I'm just going to try and catch him here. I'll just, I'll just take my tarp off just in case. The sea snakes can't really stay out of the water for more than a couple of hours, otherwise they do dry out. So it's important we get into the aquarium where he's going to be put into a rehabilitation tank. If he can recover, get his strength back, then he can be released. But it's one hell of a battle he faces. You've obviously got pretty close to him. Have you thought of a name? Mate, I'll have to call him the Hawk. He's washed up, and the, I think the hawk's washed up too. <laughs> thank you for, for looking after him, and thank you for, for everything else. Mate, Just... I still read it as a cobra. I still read it. I know you went to university and that, but I'm sure it's a cobra. <laughs> Chase, where exactly are you taking me? I'm seeing signs that are worrying me right now. I see sharks. You see sharks? Uh, the Hoff and I are going to be safe. The Hoff's going to be safe. <laughs> this way. What we'll do, we'll give him a bath yep. and then we can have a look. Okay. At the Sydney Aquarium, marine biologist Jason is taking over the Hoff's rehabilitation. The Hoff, even though it's a sea snake, is a lot like a boat because boats sitting in water for a long time will accumulate barnacles and, and all sorts of little organisms and, and he's no different. So he needs to keep on shedding his skin to keep these guys off. That's come up pretty well. Now this is pretty loose. I won't even have a go to getting his skin off. The Hoff naked. That's something new for you. You can say you undress the Hoff. <laughs> he's got a, a lot of muscle mass. He, he seems to be reasonably solid. So I'll give him a week or so to just relax without any, any interference, just monitor him. And then when he's comfortable, get a few feeds, get the condition, and then when the seas are right, we can hopefully release him. Off, you can't escape rehab. You're here for a reason. Embrace it. <laughs> All right, mate, hey, time looks, for a nap. He looks pretty good. He does, he's settling in nicely. Yeah. Yes. Jess has arrived at Sash to find out Boris's fate. The staffy was born with an extreme cleft palate and constant infections are now threatening to end his life prematurely. One way or the other, I'm going to know which way it's going to go. So, scared, scared in case it's not good news. He's my life. Surgeon Andrew Marchewski and dental expert Nadine Fiani are the team in charge of Boris's future. Wow, it's quite the hole. 3D scans show Boris's condition is much worse than anybody expected. He's got a loss of bone basically from his nose all the way down to the back of his throat, but it's actually probably about twice the size of the actual hole that we can see. We're going to have to be creative and, and radical to try and get this closed. We've got to give it a red hot go. In all honesty, I think what we could do is actually extract these teeth, so we might have to stage the procedure. It will be the first time this groundbreaking surgery has ever been attempted in Australia. What we'll do is extract these teeth, take, allow the... Take, take these out. Take them out. Take them, take out. them right out. Once that all heals, it'll allow us to have 
an extra centimeter of tissue that we can close up with. And a centimeter goes a really long way yeah. in the mouth. Well, I think we can do something. You do? Hmm. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's not okay. going to be easy. Okay. And it's going to take a while. Okay. And it's not going to be one procedure. Okay. I, I think we can do it. You think you can do it? I think we can do it. Well, that was more than I was expecting to hear. <laughs> I've got to tread very carefully with this because Jess has come here with high hopes and low expectations and I don't want to give a false hope. It's nice to get an opportunity to get something as bad as this sorted, so. Ah, oh, you say that now. You don't know what you're getting into. Thank you so much. All right, Jess. Thank you. This is his last chance. If we can't do this now, it's not going to get done. So there's, yeah, it's going to be tough. I had a call from Jess and it's great news. She is going to go ahead with Boris's surgery. It's a big decision. They just need to raise so much money. And that's why I'm heading up to see them again today. They've got their local doggy day out on and I'm hoping I can lend a hand with some of the fundraising. It should be fun. Did money for Boris to have an operation? Yep. Would they're a dollar each or six to five dollars? In New South Wales Hunter Valley, Jess is hard at work selling raffle tickets. Oh, yeah. Hey Boris. It's a big day buddy, it's a big fundraising day. We're raising plenty of money with kisses, is that what you're doing? Is that how you're doing, is it? Huh? Boris is what running is out of you? time, but $8,000 needs to be raised yeah, to pay for okay. his cleft palate operations. Hopefully everyone understands it's for him and he can stay with me forever then, instead of just a short time. Who wants to buy a raffle ticket? Yep. I'm already, um, already going here. Dollar each or six or five dollars? Yeah, I'll get you some change. I'd like to donate $20. Yeah, oh, good on you. Thank you. For a kiss. For a kiss. <laughs> Who gets the kiss? Is, is it... Do I, do I get the kiss or...? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Easiest $20 I ever made. Or Boris ever made. Happy birthday, Boris! Happy birthday, Boris! There's another reason to celebrate today. It's Boris's second birthday. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! And right now, he has no idea what lies oh, ahead. Right. <laughs> Look at him go! <laughs> it's been a massive challenge for Jess to bring up a dog like Boris. But to now try to raise money, this has been one hell of a mountain to climb for her. She's doing well so far, but it's not over yet. Yes, and I will eat more cake. That's enough, Boris. He's been a good patient, mate. He's doing good. He's gone through detox. He's eating again and we'll set him into the big pond. Two months later, the rehabilitation is finally over for the hop and he's heading home. Chris rescued the venomous sea snake after it was stranded on Bondi Beach during a storm. Here you go, hop. Sydney Harbour Bridge, Opera House, let's tick that box. Uh, Gilles, I reckon this is about right, mate. Talk about a transformation. He's shinier, he's sleekier, he's put some weight on. The Hoff is back. There you go, buddy. There he goes. That's a positive. Mate, job well done. Good on you. Great stuff. Pleasure. Hi. Jess. Hi. How are you? Hi, Boris. Hi, Uncle Boy. The day has finally doing? arrived for the first of Boris's radical operations. I'm a little bit scared to get my hopes up too high and get my heart broken again. OK. You big All good right. boy. All right, Jess. You be okay. brave too. Thank you. All right. Come on, Boris. Bye. Good boy. Oh, I'm happy to leave. Yeah, come on. If today's surgery doesn't work, Boris is on limited time. Most cleft palate puppies are put down at birth. What we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. The actual real hole is probably twice that size because there's no bone underneath this, which there should be. Dental surgeon Nadine Fiani is heading the revolutionary operation. We are going to take the teeth away in order to give ourselves as much tissue to be able to close that hole off. And at the moment, it's really the teeth that are standing in our way to reach all that lovely, lovely, healthy tissue in the cheeks. But his teeth are perfectly healthy. 
and so they're in there rock solid. And it's not just one tooth, there's nine or ten we're going to have to take out like this. In this case, a little bit of muscle does help. Boris's smile may never be the same, but he's been left with enough teeth to be able to eat normally. Oh my god. Right, it came. Bone is intact. Okay, so that was the last one. I am absolutely thrilled with how everything went today. There were definitely difficult extractions, but I think we got everything out and we managed to conserve as much bone as possible. And that's the most important thing, because that's going to be our scaffold next time. Basically, we've done half the job now. The really important part's what we've got to do in a few weeks' time. Um, and that's actually close the hole. Up you go. It puts a bit of pressure on, because it's not fixed yet. I'm sure Jess knows this is her last crack at it, and it's Boris's last crack at it as well. <gasps> Papa! Hi, Boris. Hello! Hello, lady and mum. Come on. Here you come. Oh, oh. Yeah, a month to wait. Means one more procedure. One more. Fingers crossed. If this fails, we're done. You know, we can't do anything else. Oh, good boy. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, you know, again. This should be the last time. I hope so. <laughs> no offence. <laughs> it's three weeks since Boris had ten teeth removed in readiness for today's final and most important surgery. Last night in bed I might have had a few little dark thoughts about the what if and if something goes wrong, but we've fought too hard and he's fought his whole life, so he's here against all odds. Come on, buddy. Bye, Bubba. No, you need to go. You gotta go, buddy. Come on. Be good. Come on, Boris. Be Come good. On, Come on. This is the last chance to fix the dangerous hole in his mouth. The tricky thing about today is that it's not like 95% of the work has been done and we're almost there. This is the hardest operation, the trickiest operation, and the, the operation that's probably most prone to failure. Yeah, and it didn't keep it quite quiet, but this yeah. hasn't been done very often. Oh. Didn't you? I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I'm quite nervous about it. Boris has had so many different operations and so many different people along the way trying to help him out, but the situation has now become so desperate we're having to do an operation that's never been done in Australia before and it's only the second time in the world. And just undermine all that tissue so we can then just flip it across and just go over the hole there. And then we'll be able to suture that to the bone on this side and then we'll suture another flap of tissue over the top of that. The surgery is slow and painstaking. After a marathon four hours, it's finally complete. Right on. Awesome. We're done. Well done, guys. I was going to say, I have my doubts, but it's <laughs> in terms of how it would look. But it's, yeah, you have little faith. It actually you brown. It looks very good. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. You know how you were hoping for a good result? Yeah. You just got it. Oh my god, are you serious? Mm. How good of a result. <laughs> oh my god, are you serious? Yeah. He's gone really well. Really? Yeah, really There's well. There's plenty of tissue. Yeah. Oh my god. It's taken a lot of work from a lot of people to get to this moment, but honestly, the only thanks any of us needed was to see Jess's face. Oh. I can't believe it's all done. It's all done, it's all over, and and it's it's good. Oh, Papa! <laughs> oh, Dad! Oh, you look so old. He looks tired, isn't he? Oh. You just can't forget, it's been such a long and a really tough journey to get to this point. Oh. Even though Jess wasn't in that surgery today, it was her that fixed Boris. <laughs> she saw something in him from the start that was worth saving. She wouldn't take no for an answer, and today, she got a reward. Two months later, Boris is fully recovered and the ordeal is finally over for Jess. I think he's better looking now. <laughs> now he's got the fangers out, it makes him look tougher. I know, I know, I know. It's done, he's fixed. Now we can just relax and just enjoy life.
I'm actually down here for work. I've been told to come down here because someone wants a consultation. They said it can only happen here, it can't happen in the clinic, because in the clinic, I won't see the problem, whatever that is. Chris's appointment is with six-year-old Chester. The West Highland Terrier is suffering from a weird phobia. Thanks for coming down, mate. That's all right. Good to see you. Hey, Chester. Hey, yes. yeah. This is Chester. This yes. is Chester. The dog with a problem. The dog mm -hmm. with a problem, absolutely. We've had him as a puppy, and he's the most amazing little creature, but there's uh, one major, major issue. And it's kind of ruining his and our lives in Bondi. There he comes! This is it! This is it. Wow! Oh. There lies his issue. That's, <laughs> that's it. Issue. Yeah. yeah. Skateboarders. Suddenly, this cute little dog has become a monster. He's coming within inches of grabbing those guys' legs and biting them. And the look on his face just says, if I get you, I'm going to tear you to pieces. <laughs> Who rides skateboards? Kids. 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 Exactly. exactly. So he's aggressive towards kids. Exactly. In a really weird sort of a way, in Chester's mind, there's this imminent danger of the skateboarder attacking them with this really forceful sound. What does he do? Each time he barks at the threat, the threat leaves. He's the hero. I scrape the end of his nail. That just shows you how forcefully he's actually going at those skateboarders. He's actually exactly. digging those nails in and then he lunges. If Chester does somehow manage to get off that leash and bite the kid, then obviously the kid's going to be hurt. But Mark and Jesse could be sued. And for Chester, it could be as serious as him being put down for that sort of thing. It's a situation that needs a solution. I, I, I hope I've got it. The hot summer's day has taken a terrible toll on four-year-old Titch. It's about 35 degrees today. Titch has been outside. She's really overweight. She's really, really hot. She's got heat stroke. Her airways are closing over. She's going blue, which means she's not getting enough oxygen around her body. We're trying to give her some oxygen with a mask, but it's making her panic even more. OK. No, oh, darling. <laughs> Once we've got an IV catheter in, we can give her some sedation. She's got a tube in to help her breathe and help her actually get air in there. We'll get some wet towels as well, please. A dog's normal body temperature should be no higher than 39. Hers is 41.8, so her brain is cooking. At reception, owner Janice and her daughter Lena are desperate for news about their cherished pet. You can't find mum without Titch. If mum goes up even just to go to letterbox, Titch is there carrying her dog bone. I mean, she follows me everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And it's strange just, you know, for her to be here. It's very stressful. Yeah. I just hope that she pulls through tonight. Let's put her on 100 mils an hour. Her body temperature is so high that it can cause all her organs to shut down. The top priority now is getting her temperature down, but if we drop it too suddenly, then that can cause her to crash as well. At Bondi, Chester's savage hatred of skateboards is continuing to make life hell for Mark and Jesse. There are times that we've had to kind of leave the place because it's just it's disturbing everyone else in the, uh, in the restaurant. Come here, calm down, buddy. But they'll have to wait a little longer for a solution. Right now, Chris is off to the Australian Reptile Park to help out operations manager Tim Faulkner. Tim always selects his words very carefully when he asks me to come up here. He never really tells me what it's all about. I can usually tell a lot when I first see him. The sticks. I know what the sticks mean. It's gators, isn't it? It's gators. We've got some good ones for you today. What we are doing is sampling a, a, a range of species at the park and it's basically because we occasionally get bitten, scratched and injured by some of these animals and sometimes we end up with a really nasty infection and hospitalise when we're already receiving antibiotics, we're, we're under treatment. Experienced well, keeper Obi has been right. forced to hospital several times <laughs> after serious bites. So that's what happens to you guys yeah. if the antibiotics don't work, you have to actually be yeah, the infection gets in the tendon line and if it gets in too deep, possibility of amputation of fingers and all the rest of it, so yeah, it's a bit scary. 
So what you need to do is get some idiot to come in here and get samples from inside the mouths. Yeah. To sort of see what the bacteria are in those bites. Yeah. Who's the idiot, yeah. Tim? Well, it's you today. Yeah. There's our boy. Come on. He's a Come pretty on. big unit. Keep coming. Come on. There's no easing into it. First up, it's one of the biggest gators in the park. That's it. Yeah. With one of the biggest sets of teeth in the park. That's it. Got it. One, two, three. Timmy, he's got a rope to stop him from going any further back. What's stopping him from coming further forward? Yeah, well, not a lot. It's a bit of a um, false sense of security, isn't it? I love it each time we call him up because I never quite know if he's scared or if he's loving it. And I think he's loving it. Right, I'm, I reckon I've got enough there. Whoa. Could have been your fingers. finger, Chris. Ah. Hey, we'd have the right antibiotics for it. Chris only needs one alligator sample, but his torrid day so is just beginning. She is a member of the largest snake family on Earth. Go. Right, everyone on. He now has to get a swan from there, Monster, that coil. a 100 kilogram reticulated python. The challenge here is that a lot of her teeth are sitting quite a way at the back, and she's got a head that can lunge forward as well, so you've got to get in there, but just be mindful of the fact that Monster here will lunge forward. Good morning, visitors, and welcome to the Australian Reptile Park. Starting in five minutes' time... Did you have a heart attack? In the end, it wasn't Monster that scared me the most. It was the monstrous PA announcement that nearly killed me. This is... Oh, oh. Well, That's what's going to go oh. into us. There's no way I'm getting cocky yet. Sure, we're two from two, but I just know Tim's still got some more surprises for us. There you go, mate. The last one needs moving, to come keep from moving. a Tasmanian devil. Ah, well done. Well, hey, 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 hey! But this fella's not keen on being part of Let's the medical well, research. Right. Not happy. Not happy at all. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, you got it. Then we got it, didn't we? Yeah. All right. Talk to little fella. Yeah. Okay, you gonna let him go? Yep. <laughs> I don't think that's hygienic the stuff that's smeared over you. Nah, I don't think so, neither is that. <laughs> I do hope that those samples will make a difference and ensure those keepers are kept free of infections and really have their limbs intact for many years to come. For me though, I'm just grateful to be leaving with these. That's good work. Yeah, no, that's right. Ah, oh, it's fine, Alex. Let's wet her, because she's still cooking. She's 41.4 now. At Sash, Lisa is still desperately trying to cool down heat stroke victim Titch, but she has to be very careful. Got to get her body temperature down, otherwise she can suffer brain damage and multi-organ failure. And you just make sure you keep her tongue nice and moist, because she'll cool from there too. Finally, Titch is showing some signs of improvement. Yeah, we've got a really slight reduction in temperature. It's the first one we've seen. We're just going to wet her with some lukewarm water. We don't ever want to use iced water on her because it can drop their body temperature too quickly. It's about doing it gradually, monitoring it really closely and making sure that we're, we're dropping it slowly but surely. Distraught owners Janice and Lena are allowed in for a few minutes to comfort her. Oh, my baby. I love Titch. But Mum and Titch, you can't even describe what they have. It's so strong. Sort of like mother and daughter. I doubt she'll be getting any sleep tonight. She's OK, Mum. She's in best care. You be a good girl. Thank you. It's okay. So we're not we're not out of the woods yet, but her body temperature's come okay. down. We'll call you if we have any problems. <laughs> I think they were just so shocked by everything that's happening. It's all very overwhelming and, and it must have been a pretty scary thing to see. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you so much. This is definitely one of the hardest kind of cases to deal with. It's when I want to be able to tell an owner that I'm going to get their pet better, but I can't. Oh, 
was just so overweight. Titch is still in intensive care at SASH. Lisa is certain her obesity has contributed to this critical case of heat stroke. Titch is morbidly overweight. She's 21 kilos. I mean, she should be between 13 to 15 kilos. And that, combined with her really thick hair coat on a hot summer's day, puts her at huge risk. Removing Titch's fur will help her maintain a normal body temperature. Hey, baby. We're just slowly waking her up. I don't want her to panic too much. And I, I just hope that she can breathe on her own without having difficulty. She's not looking great at the moment, is she? What we're going to do is put a little tube in her nose to give her some oxygen. The most important thing now is just to leave her alone, not stress her out too much, and just fingers crossed she doesn't have to be re-intubated. Another episode of stress and panic could be the difference between her making it through the night or not. Good girl, Titch. What I want is really good audio, really clear audio of those wheels going across that concrete. Next day, Chris is back on the Chester case. He's about to try a left-field idea to cure the terrier's dangerous hatred of skateboards. Chester! It's a massive issue. It's a massive extravaganza when a skateboard goes past. That would be I mean, a little kid scenario. on a skateboard with a parent comes past, he gets the ankle, throws blood. He might get put down. All I need is for you guys to go up here and then skate back. Mix it up, so go pretty close, do a few tricks, really kick it out and actually produce heaps of noise. I've got everything I need. I just hope once I put it all together, it's going to work. Hmm, this is good. To fix an extreme problem, you sometimes need to come up with a fairly extreme and unique solution. It's called the dog pod. It's a collar attached to an underwater iPod and it plays the sounds of skateboarders every few seconds. I reckon that is all right. See the work. Titchy, hi puppy girl. Titch has pulled through overnight and survived her deadly case of heat stroke. I know, oh, it's not easy to walk around like this, is it? But Lisa is concerned the overweight family pet could suffer a relapse if she doesn't go on an immediate diet. Good girl. That's the way. In Titch's case, obesity is really threatening her life and unfortunately in Australia we see obesity as probably one of the biggest health problems in our pets. Come, Luffy. It's our animals that don't have the willpower, they don't have that common sense to know that being overweight is bad for them. Come, Titch. Often it gets to the point where you see your animal every day, you don't actually realise how overweight they are. She's looking pretty sheepish. She's seen the numbers on the scale. She's got the motivation now. I'm expecting to see a big improvement. This is where the skateboarders come rushing past and it's a big threat. Yeah. To counter that, I've got something that might surprise you. Back at Bondi, Chris is ready to unleash his secret weapon. He's hoping it will cure Chester's fanatical hatred of skateboards. <laughs> Chester now has his own iPod. That's hilarious. So it sits just outside Chester's ears. He hears the sound of skateboards every few seconds. And no matter how much he whimpers, barks, gets upset, they just keep on coming back. So I'll press play and once it's going, we'll just walk straight away. Yep. It's brilliant. If it works, it's absolutely brilliant. He can hear it, but he doesn't know where it is. Yeah. You can see he's panting, he's yeah. pacing, he's really anxious. This is exactly what I want. Whilst it's not the most pleasant thing for Chester initially, what it's doing is saying to him, no matter what you do, the sound's always going to be there. You just have to learn to live with it. And he will. Mark and Jesse think the tricks have ended with the dog pod. Oh no. So whenever you're walking Chester, I want you guys oh, to walk this as well. Okay. I'm going to look slightly silly. 
what I've been working hard to achieve up until now is desensitising Chester to the sound of skateboards. Now, we're going to work on the sight of them. This is one hell of a way to get him over his phobia. It's already not such a big deal. He's not even looking at it. He's not even recognising it at the moment. With the vast majority of behavioural situations, there's no quick fix. The only way you get results is with a lot of hard work. From here on in, it's up to Mark and Jesse to see if they can really turn him around. I did feel slightly silly with it, but I'm going to do it, Chris. If it works, it works. That's all that matters, isn't it? Hello. Hi. Threatening case of heat stroke, Titch is back with her relieved owners, Janice and Melina. I'm so happy to see she's <laughs> alright. You're gonna go home. You're gonna go home. So we've done the weigh in yeah. today. Yeah. 22.2. Yeah. So we need to get her down to about 13. Yeah. So she's got about it's... nine kilos to go. That's like half her body weight. <laughs> It's I've got a big job, haven't I? <laughs> you know, I've got to keep her on a diet. She's got to lose some weight. Of course, I'll spoil her in other ways, you know, TLC and all that. Lisa, this is for oh. you and your staff. Thank you so much. That is so lovely. I don't want anyone else, you know, for their dogs to go through that, because it is upsetting. So, lessons learnt. All right. Here you go. Go. So he's walking along, yeah. minding his own business. He has a look. It's better. It's better. Yeah. It's better. It's so he's interested, better. but he's not doing that lunging, desperate exactly. dive to exactly. bite. Well, he's not trying to kill anymore. <laughs> Two months later, Chester's skateboard therapy is slowly getting results. But see, that's a big improvement. Yeah, exactly. And he's not cured, but I think he's getting there, you know? Given time. But one more test, though. OK. It's about as large as a test gets. OK, cool. Nothing going on? Chester's reaction, or non-reaction, it's great. You're not interested. You want to leave. There's no doubt there's been some rather unorthodox techniques used to help Chester. iPods, walking a skateboard. It's been strange, but today I think we've seen that it has made a difference. Yep, this is definitely it. Drop. Girl. I spend a lot of time telling people that being a vet isn't about cute puppies. Today it is. Is there a problem the fact they're, they're too cute? Is that why I'm here? Is it trying to re reduce the cute factor? Chris is at the guide dog headquarters to carry out health checks on the first litter of pups ever bred in house. Is licking part of the guide dog program or? Well, they're not biting, are they? That's a good sign. <laughs> Resident vet Carolyn Moser is hoping their carefully selected bloodlines will produce a new breed of super guide dogs. The whole process of raising a guide dog, training them and eventually getting them out to their new owner costs $25,000 per dog. These puppies don't just have to be happy and healthy little guys. They have to be behaviourally and medically perfect because you can't send a guide dog out to a blind person and have the guide dog racing off down the street chasing the neighbour's cat. That ain't going to work. OK, that's all fine. The only thing I'm noticing with her, Millie, Missy, Molly... Molly. Whatever. <laughs> is this tear staining here? A defect as simple as blocked tear ducts is enough to have them thrown out of the program. We're going to use some fluorescent dye to check whether these tear ducts are functioning. Okay, so let's go down the group and see what we see here. If they are, then the tears will run from the eye right down to the nostrils and we'll see the dye come out through the nostrils. There's a little bit coming out the nose there. If it's bad news and the tear duct's blocked, it will stay in the eye and then run down the face. So those tear ducts are blocked as well. So we've got a little bit of a problem there in terms of how many have blocked tear ducts. The treatment for these blocked tear ducts is pretty simple. Puppy eye massage. Two fingers around the face and try to stimulate the blood flow and try to stimulate that tear duct to start to open. 
If the massage therapy doesn't work, then there's only one other solution. We do try surgery, um, and if that doesn't work, then, then yeah, they'd be rejected. It is very early days for these puppies. They're only five weeks of age, and they have so much more testing and training to do before they can become guide dogs. You're excited about it, aren't you? Hmm? Look at you. I think they want to sleep, Caroline. Yeah, we'll let them go back to mum, hey? Yeah. You're very hot. Maru has been rushed into the Very Bondi good. Referral Hospital SASH exactly after collapsing in 40 degree heat. Hey buddy, Maru has been panting at home, he's been vomiting, he seems listless. John thinks he's got heat stroke and he's brought him straight over here. Life for a dog is as precious as a human for me. Yeah. Hey baby, I know, I know, you're alright. Do you want to get his temperature? He looks like a hot dog, he feels hot, but he hasn't actually got a high temperature and uh, I wonder if he's got a tick. There it is. Pretty big one. Not heat stroke after all, huh? You've got a tick. All right, all right, OK. Lisa is now hoping time in the oxygen chamber will help stabilise the distressed Pomeranian. So the most important thing now is that we give him some sedation and some oxygen and let him settle down because with tick paralysis, stress is one of the things that can actually make them get a lot worse very quickly. Worst case scenario is that his breathing muscles down here yeah. get paralysed and then he'll need to be put on a ventilator. Okay. John absolutely loves Maru. He would do anything for him. He's his new little friend. You can pat him. Okay. At this point, I, I don't know if Mara's going to survive. It's really early days. He's pretty badly affected. And I really, really hope that we can get him through this. Ever since Africa, I've just been itching for a chance to go up close to big cats again. So today, I'm on my way to Mogo Zoo to see a Sumatran tiger with a really painful problem. Chris is a regular visitor to the Mogo Zoo, located four hours south of Sydney. Hey Sal, how are hey, you? Hey Chris, how are you going, hey? It's good. Sally's called me in because she has a Sumatran tiger with a toothache. It's a problem that's not going to be easily fixed. Come on down, Chris. Hey there, come on. The keepers were feeding her one evening and noticed that she was very tentative about um, chewing on a particular side and uh, got her to open her mouth and there, bingo, fractured straight through. Hey, can you open up and say ah? The problem with Saraya's tooth is that when it's cracked through, it's exposed the pulp of the tooth, but also the nerve. So any time anything touches that tooth, it'd be excruciating for Saraya. So what she needs is two words, that sand a shiver down in one spine, a root canal. I've done plenty of dentals on cats, but never on a really, really big cat with really, really big teeth. So it's gonna be a really, really big challenge. Hey, little guy. Oh, this sounds terrible. At SASH, the poison from a paralysis tick is shutting down little Maru's system. Tick paralysis not only paralyses the legs, it can also paralyse the breathing muscles. He's really breathing with a lot more effort and I, I worry that he's actually not getting enough air in because his upper airways are collapsing from the tick. If we just sit on the fence with him, he's going to get a lot worse very quickly. He hasn't responded to the station, so we have to put a tube down his throat. We need to get that tick anti-serum into him, support him until he regains some strength. As a precaution, Maru's entire body is now being shaved. No ticks yet? Not so far. No more ticks are found, but the toxin from one has completely debilitated the tiny Pomeranian. Lisa, yeah. he's not looking real good. What's happening? He's not taking his own breath. He's struggling. Yeah. He just can't breathe on his own anymore. We'll put him on the ventilator. It's going to be better for him. I think he's just so weak now that he, he's not coping with it. Looking at Maru's breathing, his muscles are just becoming weaker and weaker from the tick toxin, and he can't breathe on his own. And without a machine, he's going to die. No, it's not you today. 
And your teeth are perfect. Look at them. They are. At the Mogo Zoo, really close. it's time for Soraya's root canal surgery. Lock her in. The anxious mother has been separated from her cubs and now needs to be anaesthetised by resident vet Sam Young. So she obviously knows what's about to happen. Yes. Yeah. Sensing that. When it comes to knocking them down and things like that, I always get very nervous. There is always risks associated with it. I don't like to think that, oh no, it might be the last time we see you. Now that we know the dart's actually hit her, it's gone in, it's injected the anaesthetic, we now have to stand back and just make sure she goes down, but also that she goes down deep enough that we can get in there. Ready? Yep. Tigers are like people in one way. They don't go to the dentist willingly, so we have to bring the dentist to Soraya, and that's what we've done today. A whole lot of equipment, a whole lot of expertise, a lot of challenges along the way, and I don't know, you've got to be nervous. <laughs> you know, this is the worst, worst possible worst, thing. Worst case scenario. It's, um, I don't know if he's going to come off. That's the problem. I keep fingers crossed. Paralysis tick victim Maru is clinging to life at Sash. The tiny Pomeranian is in an induced coma. Only a ventilator is keeping him alive. I just feel so sorry for John. I mean, he's obviously devastated. It's a pretty emotional time. I'm just praying that he'll, he'll recover very quickly. Mm. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to sell our other car. Maru is so lucky to have an owner like Jong. He's only been with him for two months and he has already agreed that he would sell his car to get Maru better. Now that's love. It's pretty amazing. Having Maru on the ventilator will cost at least $2,000 a day. You're letting us do everything we can and now it's up to him. I can't promise him if Maru's ever going to come off the ventilator. And even if Maru's improving each day, they can change like that and, and he could die suddenly. We really have to take it day by day. You look around the room and there are a lot of serious faces because if anything can go wrong, it's going to go wrong right now. With Soraya now sedated and restrained, the extent of the Sumatran tiger's tooth fracture is finally revealed. So she's got crown fracture, so that's very, very painful, very sore. Chris has invited Sash dental surgeon Nadine Fiani to perform the delicate operation. Her canal is a spectacular seven centimetres. That's huge. The so seven centimetres of tooth. Beneath that fracture. <laughs> Just below the fracture, yeah. Crazy stuff. Nice. What we'll be doing is going inside the tooth itself with some files and basically scraping the inside out, getting all that nasty muck, the infection, all out of there. All this black material you're seeing coming out is the infected part, so you can see that really the damage you see on the surface is nothing compared to what's actually brewing underneath, and what's brewing is, is quite a serious infection. That's it. Much less black muck coming out now, so we're, we're winning. But Soraya has now been on the operating table for more than an hour. As every minute goes by, the risk to the Sumatran tiger is dramatically increasing. She's breathing a bit more rapidly than lions and tigers normally do and uh, a little bit more erratically than I would like, so I'm just keeping a very close eye on her. after you but we want you to wake up so we can get to meet you and know your personality. At Sash, yeah. paralysis tick bite victim Maru is still in an induced coma. Only a ventilator is keeping him alive. I'm so worried about Maru and I can't even imagine what Jong's going through. He's just going through this roller coaster of emotions and 
it's really stressful for everyone. I know we didn't come off the machine today, but you gotta do it tomorrow, all right? Because your daddy's waiting for you. You are. So I'll keep an eye on the heart rate. I think, I think she's a little bit deeper. At Mogo Zoo, the surgical team is under pressure to complete Soraya's crucial root canal operation. Time under anaesthesia is vital for these guys. So the shorter that we can keep her under, the better it is for her and the safer as well. What we want to do is make sure we get that right down to the bottom. The purpose of this mixture here is to push in there and just like putty to fill in that gap. And that really gives the tooth strength but also prevents any infection from occurring from here. It's actually going all right right now, but you just have to remember you can't rush this sort of thing. Each step takes a certain amount of time and rush those steps and it just won't work out. After two hours, Nadine is finally happy with the result. You are home and dry. My job is done. It is, it is a relief. I feel like everything went very well. With the operation over, Chris has a small window of time to admire the formidable Soraya. Just the size of her paws and the size of these nails here. Just her forearms and her, her triceps and her arms there. I mean, she's a small tiger, but you look at that. Bodybuilder would be happy with that sort of arm. It's amazing. Hi, Lise. Hi. I heard what happened to Maru. You OK? Maru's heart just stopped. He just had a sudden cardiac arrest. Don't know why it happened. Couldn't predict that it was going to happen and it's just shocked all of us. It's really devastating. OK, I'll, I'll let him rest. Jong is absolutely shattered by this. He loved Maru so much. He really wants everyone to learn from Maru's death. It's the hardest thing with these two cases. They're just, you know, we do absolutely everything. everything. And it's just yeah. a lot of people think that it's just tick anti-serum and they walk out the door the next day, but that's not the case. There are cases like Maru where the toxin is just so deadly that they don't survive. OK, so can we start moving? Yeah. Chris, there's, would you like to what I can do about turn it. her up to five? You can just get those out for you, though. It was only when I looked around the group that I realised just how much of a team effort it was. Everyone did their job and did it well. And thankfully, Soraya got through it. Yes. She's off. Soraya's root canal operation has been a success, but now the big cat has to be moved back to her den. Just move her back towards the table a bit. There's no reflex. the nerve-wracking time because if she in the process of waking up starts to swallow a tongue then you can't go in there and move it because she's awake enough to do something about you. It could all come unstuck right now. How many minutes has it been now? 10 to 15? Yeah. Mm. At Mogo Zoo, everyone is waiting and hoping for Soraya to regain consciousness after her root canal surgery. Even after we've done so much, you just can't celebrate until she is totally awake, sitting up and looking alive because things can still go wrong right now. Soraya. Honestly, I'm really trying hard not to look at Sal's face because she is just riding this emotional wave because it's one of her babies. There we go. Ah. Hey. Yeah. Me. It's alright. It's okay, girl. It's alright. Soraya's going to be a little bit sleepy for the next few hours, but slowly but surely, all those little instincts of hers will kick back into action, and she'll be back with the cubs before she knows it. Looking good, team. Yeah. Well done, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you Thanks very much. much. Yeah, no worries, thank you. Thank well you. done, Sam. Great to have you and involved. And well done, you, huh? Thanks very so much. Well. Thank you. <laughs> but before Chris heads back to Bondi, there's one last member of the Mogo Menagerie for him to treat. OK, so just before you go, I've just yeah. got somebody I'd really like you to meet. A little 
Debraza's monkey who's diabetic that we've been managing very closely for the last few months. Good girl. So that's her insulin there and I have to give it to her every day so it would be fantastic today if you would like to give it to her so I'm not the big meanie. <laughs> You've got to remember that monkeys are just like little people. I feel like I'm being set up here. <laughs> and like us, they have their good days and they have their bad days. And being a Debrasis monkey, Kamani is also known to be a bit of a biter. So when I bring out this insulin injection, it could become a very bad day for both of us. There we go. Very good. <laughs> Not too sure about me now, are you? <laughs> the secret to treating Kamani is food bribery. Works every time. How much can you handle? She likes sweet potato. You take that as well? Yep. <laughs> about that. Cool. <laughs> with this species, we wouldn't normally be able to go in with them, but she's a very special individual. She even quite enjoys a bit of a pat, as long as she's got some food in her mouth. What? You always go looking for something better. You'll never be happy in your life. You always think there's something better. You like that? I've been an ambassador for Assistance Dogs Australia for years now, and I've just had a call from their CEO, Richard Lord, to tell me that one of their dogs has gone into labour. Now, that's interesting, but what's really fascinating is where she's giving birth right now. It's 11 p.m. and Chris is heading to a very unusual maternity ward. Our girls giving birth in jail. At the EMU Plains Correctional Centre west of Sydney, Chris is met by the manager of security, Angie West. So we've had one puppy. Yep, one puppy. Yep. There's no doubt this is an extremely strange situation to be let into a prison to deliver a litter of puppies. It's not every day you do that. I'm Chris. I'm Jodie. How are you hey, going? How are you? For 10 years, assistance dogs pups have been raised by inmates in prisons around Australia. But this is a groundbreaking moment in the program. When you remember that this is the first time ever assistance dog puppies have been born inside a prison, it's a pretty special night. And for me as an ambassador, it's one that I was never going to miss. This is Brielle. This is Brielle. And she's just been panting like this. Panting, yep. No straining. Only pushing the pup out, yep. yep. Prison inmate Jodie's been Brielle's carer for the past four months and delivered the first puppy on her own. I knew something was going to happen. She gave me a look of help. Help me, please. I just patted her and let her know that I will be here for her the whole way through. We've got a puppy just coming actually coming in right now. Just let her give her a final push. Yep. Okay. And we're away. All right. I'll just get this sack yep. up nice and quickly. So we're wriggling, which is good. I'm just going to tear that umbilical cord like that. Let mum do her work. The worry with a small puppy is that even a small amount of blood lost can be pretty significant. I'm just going to tie off the umbilical cord. If you just hold it there. Yep. So that's why I go to the clamp straight away and stop that bleeding. Yeah. X-rays have indicated Brielle is expecting a huge litter of 11 puppies. The thing that I guess is worrying me right now is the fact that she's going to become exhausted no matter how she approaches this. It's going to be a long night for her. It's going to be a long night for all of us. What happened? Did she get stepped on or...? No, um, I only my sister at the shop and then her boyfriend called. Apparently she on the cat scratch mm -hmm. post and she fell over. Okay, all right. If you just At wait the here, Bondi I'll... Referral Hospital sash, Melissa is in shock after four-week-old kitten Ariel was involved in a freak accident at home. Little Ariel has fallen off a scratching post, which doesn't sound very high at all, but to a kitten that's only 300 grams. Falling from half a metre is enough to cause massive head trauma. She's got soft little bones and I'm really worried that her brain has taken a massive knock. Oh dear, you don't look very good at all, baby. What was her temperature? 34.8. Okay, she's freezing. Tiny, tiny little veins. Lisa will now give the kitten IV fluids and use a heat mat to try to raise her temperature. The problem is, just by looking at her, we can't really tell if it's brain damage or if all of this is just a sign of her being in shock. If she goes home, she won't make it, so she's got to stay in hospital. It's heartbreaking news for sisters Melissa and Vanessa. It's too early for me to know if she's going to be able to get better from this, but it's 100% worth giving her a chance. 
Okay. So sorry, I won't be long. She just needs a lot of TLC right now and I'm hoping that we can get her through this, but she's so small that it's possible she's not going to make it. Now since the last puppy, I just want to feel and see where these puppies are at the moment. Chris is at the Emu Plains Correctional Centre. He's helping inmate Jody to deliver the first litter of assistance dog puppies ever born inside a prison. She's still quite big, so we know there's still quite a few puppies in there. Brielle has already given birth to two pups, but there are grave concerns for the remaining nine. I have a very strong bond with Brielle. These pups are so special, and we've had such a big involvement in the whole process. They've become a whole world. Where's your puppies? I didn't feel a puppy engaged in that birth canal. And from there, it should be on the fast track, on the escalator going out. But it's, it's just sitting there. The issue I have in that birth canal is it's narrow and it compresses the puppies. If it compresses those puppies for too long, then the blood no longer goes to their brain and you can lose them there. So we might give her an injection and, and get things moving. An oxytocin injection should induce stronger contractions. All right, so we're getting some contractions. Yep. Oh, look. Finally, Brielle delivers another puppy. Here we go again. She might want to see. I don't think Brielle really knows what's happening. Yeah, got another contraction there. She's sitting and there's a puppy there. So they're coming thick and fast right now. Yeah, I said she had to move it along. It did. The fact is, I'll take them lying down, sitting down, upside down. Whichever way they're coming, as long as they're coming out, I'm happy. Oh, there we go. We've now got five puppies out, but when you look at Mum, she's starting to look pretty tired, and that worries me because she's still got a lot of work to do tonight. And if we start to lose her, then all those puppies still inside of her are in big trouble. Oh, baby. At SASH, Lisa suspects four-week-old Ariel may have suffered brain damage after falling from a scratching post. She's just out here. After hours of waiting, distressed sisters Melissa and Vanessa are finally able to see their fragile kitten. You can give her a cuddle, it's OK. Melissa's only had little Ariel and her brother for three days. They got them as rescue kittens and they've fallen in love with them only after such a short time. And for something like this to happen, it's really distressing for them. They don't even know if Ariel's going to make it and they've still got the little brother at home who's pining for his big sister. It's a lot to take in. Thank you. That's all right. We'll look after her and um, we'll call you if we have any issues. OK, so just got to try and think positive. but. No, there's obviously no guarantee. Okay. She's still got signs of head trauma. There's no way of knowing whether she'll ever recover from this. Here we go. Well done, girl. That's a big one too. Yeah. Back at the Emu Plains prison, Brielle has just given birth to puppy number 10. <laughs> this one's trouble. Straight away, you know. <laughs> when they're born, it's almost like they're a member of the royal family. They can't hope to understand what lies ahead of them. They have this destiny. They'll grow into being assistance dogs. Dogs with such an incredible purpose. Got anything more in there? Give us another push. It's obviously been a big ordeal for her to get 10 puppies out to this point, but I guess she has to muster all her reserves for one final effort to produce this last puppy. Right now it's really hard to tell whether Brielle's work is done or whether my work is far from over. You never better out than him. I wouldn't know that personally, but that's what they tell me. You got any more for us? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Where's the other one? Where's the other one gone? At the Emu Plains prison, it's been more than 30 minutes since Brielle delivered her last baby. X-rays had shown she was expecting 11 puppies, but it looks like technology got it wrong. She just looks like she is. She looks like she's satisfied. 
Inmate Jody and Chris are now convinced the long labour is finally over for this patient mum. So now I feel there and I just can't feel it out. So I think that... That's it. That's it, yeah. Ten's not bad. Not done. When it comes a time in a young man, man's life where they ask you what you're going to be when you're older, well, I can tell you. Well, you're going to be an assistant dog, aren't you? Well, this is just the start of something massive. They've got such an important role with people with disabilities. They're born to give the best to somebody that can't give the best to themselves. I would never have imagined being able to be a part of something like this. They're in very good hands. Okay. All right, take care. Okay, thank you. No problem. I would hope after everything I've seen tonight and how amazing Jodie's been, that assistance dogs might look at her and go, you'd make a pretty good puppy raiser and she can have at least one of these puppies. You're such a good girl. Yes, you are. You're such a good girl. I can't describe the love I feel already for Briel and these pups. Baby, hey, you're so tiny. 24 hours after being rushed into the sash emergency room, tiny Ariel is still unresponsive after falling from a scratching post. With such a little kitten, it's essential that they start eating as soon as possible. So it would be a really big test if she reacts to food, if she's eating, if she's interested in it. Uh, it's a test of her strength and her mental function as well. The bowl is bigger than you, but is that something you would be interested in? This little girl's been through a lot. She's had a big knock to the head. We're all working really, really hard to get her through this. You're not quite with us, are you? She still could deteriorate and we just have to keep a really close eye on her for the next 24 hours. I just had a call from the police. Now, this is a strange one. Apparently, they've discovered a snake on a road in the suburbs. They've managed to catch it, but they're saying that it looks hurt. So I'm on my way now to investigate what's going on. There you go. It's Chris's oh, yeah. second late night call in a Chris. week. This one's Chris. going to be hey, even going? more confronting. Hey, Brendan, how are you going? Good. Now, where is it? OK. So you found him just around here, did you? Just in front of the car. Yeah. A couple of guys next door. And him slid him across the road. Mate Simon and Ashton managed to catch the snake after discovering it on the road. I was driving past and I thought someone was playing a uh, practical joke on the road here with a big rubber snake. So uh, I did a U-turn and came back and it raised its little head and had a little bit of a hiss and we went, that's definitely a snake and we'd better call someone who's got more of an idea than what we do. Not gonna lie to him, we'll be out of the comfort zone. Jeez, look at that. It looks pretty serious. It, it's hard to know exactly what that is, but it's popped out its cloaca, so out its back end. Mm. And I mean, it could be anything from a bit of intestine to its penis, even a testicle or a kidney. But that shouldn't be there. The best thing to do is probably to get him back to the vets and give him a full check over and just see what's actually going on with it. The encouraging thing for me right now is just how active he is. He's certainly wriggling around, but each time he does that, he produces more lactic acid. And for a reptile, lactic acid is the enemy that's caused by stress, too much of it, and it will kill him. Hi. Thanks for getting up. It's 2 a.m. when Chris and the Diamond Python arrive back at the Bondi Clinic. Do you like snakes? Love him. Are you really? Wow. He's woken vet nurse Ali to help treat the hit-run victim. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, he's stunning, isn't he? But for a second, maybe, I have to step up and be the big, tough guy. No. Ali loves snakes. No tough guy required, which is sort of lucky, really. His name's Neil. I decided that. Everything. Neil Diamond. <laughs> yeah. When I suggested Neil Diamond as a name, I thought, oof, bit daggy, but we'll just get away with it. Turns out Ali's a fan. One day the bad names will stop, but <laughs> until that day, Neil. What is that? Well, just on its position, the fact it's got that little stalk there, 
instead of it being something like a kidney or a, or a testy, I think it's, it's a scent gland. Snakes have two scent glands which enable them to mark territory and attract a mate. We're going to have to remove this. Mm -hmm. But you can see also he's got a little bit of extra stuff poking out through his, his bottom here as well. Yeah. So we're actually going to have to try to shrink that down. Put some sugar in here. Add some water. I do with the sugar is if you make it really strong into a paste that we have here mm -hmm. and put it over the top of this, then the sugar actually draws all the fluid out and actually okay. shrinks this up. It's actually now popped itself back in, so the sugar's done the job. Well done, little buddy. See? Hmm? It's alright, isn't it? He's been through a lot of stress tonight. He needs warmth, he needs a nice heat lamp, and he just needs to calm down. If he can do that, then he might just recover. Hello. Oh, you are so much better. At Sash, it's been just 48 hours since Ariel took a dangerous dive from a scratching post. If she eats really well and she eats consistently, she's on the road to going home. It's so yummy. Oh, that's a really good sign, baby girl. I feel so relieved now that she's responding well, so I'm not so worried about brain injury anymore, which is great. It's not only Melissa and Vanessa who are excited about being reunited with Ariel. This is Oliver. He's Ariel's brother. They were abandoned together. <laughs> Hi, Jess. Hi. She's so much better than she was. She's been through a lot. Yeah. It will take her a few days to to bounce back. The girls, they are just over the moon. I, I don't even think they can believe that she's still alive. Good luck. Thank you. you guys Thank will you. be fine. They're in very lucky hands. Hey all. You know what, mate? You're looking good, you're looking fresh, you're looking relaxed. Three days later, while hit run victim Neil Diamond is resting up at the Bondi Clinic, Chris receives a present from a secret admirer. Where, were <laughs> Where have these come from? Looking around the room for anyone whose face might be giving something away. You're a secret admirer, then? Uh, yep. Yeah. Sponsor me! <laughs> <laughs> The crew is saying it's not them, but I know the truth. This is a stitch up. If there's a snake in here, someone will die. No snake in the box and no answer as to who sent Chris the flowers. But there's no time for further inquiries. It's a big day, buddy. Rehab's over. Right now, Neil Diamond is very impatient to leave the clinic. He's eaten, he's put on some weight. He looks happy and pain free, so for me, it's time for him to go. When you think back, it has been quite a journey for Neil. He was run over by a car, had an encounter with the law, a vacation in Bondi over summer, but now he's here, where he belongs. It's just stunning against that green background. It's, it's beautiful. Dr. Chris, how are you? Good, how have they been going? Oh, great, they've just grown oh, so wow. much. Chris is back at the Emu Plains Correctional Centre to visit Jody, Brielle and the 10 assistance dog puppies he helped deliver. Have we got enough? Typical prison <laughs> officer always counting. They're just bliss. Look at these animals. They are gorgeous. They're always kissing me. He loves me. <laughs> it's a nice thing to come in and see the impact that it has um, with people that are working with them and also the inmates. It's life changing for them. It brings out a good side, it brings out a caring side and, and, and loving side and I, I guess here you don't really get to show that. You're She's a very boy. good girl. You're a good boy. Being able to give your love to these animals is gives you back your love. Within weeks, the puppies will be leaving to start their training. It's still hope Jody will be able to raise one of them here. They're going to make a big contribution and Jody's been a big part of that. It'll be a sad day. Mm. When they go, yeah. Hey Karen, how are you going? Oh, great, how are you? Yeah, I'm alright. I should be about 10 minutes away. 
Chris is in far north Queensland to check out a bizarre animal emergency. I'll see you in your bull soon. Oh, thank you. A passionate plea for help from a small community is taking him to Machen's Beach just outside of Cairns. If even half of what I've heard about this bull is true, then this is just an amazing story. According to Karen, he was washed over a waterfall during raging floodwaters and somehow came ashore at this beach. It was 1999 when Cyclone Rona unleashed her fury and caused catastrophic flooding. Herds of cattle were washed away. Most drowned. Now it seems like this lucky survivor is now facing another life-threatening challenge. And that's why I'm here. So this is a legend, huh? I'm Karen, hi, how nice are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hello, big guy. This is Bully. Around these parts, you'd think the tourist attractions are the Great Barrier Reef for the Daintree Rainforest. Bully pulls a crowd around here. People will pull up just to have their photos taken with Bully. For 13 years, Bully's been kept alive by the generosity and love of the locals. He gets mangoes in the mango season. People bring down hay for him. He, he gets molasses, um, loves bread. We've just been concerned about this horn that's growing sideways into his head. His horns have been cut before, but now one of them is regrowing and actually growing into his skull. Not nice for him, and I think eventually it's going to cause him a lot of grief. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I mean, so, if it isn't already. That's yeah, a... probably giving him headaches and stuff now. Yeah. Kiss me on the neck. I think he's in love. <laughs> <laughs> never had a ball so quickly attracted. <laughs> you know what that means? He's attracted to you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so when he does it, he gets right up there. It's called flaming, and he's trying to put the pheromones into the back of his nostrils, and it means that he wants to breed with me. Then you take that. Have a little look here. Yeah, wow, that's really pressing in. It is, isn't it? Yeah, I hey, just mate. feel really sorry for him. The more it pushes in, the more pressure it causes, eventually it'll actually start pushing into his skull and into his brain. And that could kill him. Another Chris Brown, I don't know. While Chris is trying to help out Bully in far north Queensland, back in Bondi, Neil's taken delivery of a surprise package. Chris, he gets fan mail, he gets proposals from members of the public. Now we've got a second Chris. I feel really neglected. It's always about Chris. You can be on permanent display there. How's that? Oh, I don't like it. <laughs> it's a bit too scary. Come on, Chris, I know where you're best off. In the cupboard out the way. In you go. Done. My hope is if I can actually sedate him, mm. then I might be able to get a wire in there and actually start chopping. Like a garrot type yeah, wire? Yeah, yeah. But the, the thing is, I want to be quick. The minute you start sort of putting any pressure on that, he's going to burr up with it, yeah. you know? In Machen's Beach, the real Chris Brown is coming up with a plan to save Bully. The community pet's life is being threatened by a horn pressing into his skull. My plan for Bully is really to win him over using a few special little treats the locals tell me he really likes. If I can do that, get him liking me, then maybe I might be able to get that injection in. And from there, he'll be sedated enough that I can actually saw that horn off. The crowd's building. So is the pressure on Chris. Oh, yes. I mean, he's under the microscope. <laughs> I reckon I can't kill him, which is pretty scary, so something needs to be done. I'm just going to aim for that muscle in his neck there. It's a really delicate balance between giving him too much or giving him too little and having him run off into the bush and never see him again. He's gone. I didn't give him quite enough to actually sedate him. He's taken off into the bush. He's pretty cagey, Chris, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Really, if I keep on pushing with Bully today, we run the real risk of him losing trust in everyone around here. So it's probably right to back off a little bit, come up with a new game plan, and try to do it properly. I'm gonna give it to you. You won round one, absolutely, hands down. But you see, 
I've got a few things that I reckon are going to go in my favour. Chris is in Machen's Beach, just outside Cairns, to help community pet Bully. The bullock's horn is pressing into his brain and needs to be removed. I'm calling him the heavy artillery. Boys, this might be just a trick, I reckon. So we've got a few people to help us out. Here the locals. G'day, guys. Hey, hey thank doing? you. Tony and Tom have volunteered to assemble a cattle pen. We put this one in the corner there. Yep. It seems everybody in this community is willing to help. Perfect. The moment that injection goes in, he clearly becomes a little bit nervous and takes off for the bush. Now, that just can't happen if we give him a high dose. It's going to be dangerous for him and it's no good for us. So now it's up. Let's have to get him in here. I know. The hard part is getting him to trust us because I think probably the last time he was in yards was when he was, you know, with, at the butchers ready to go to the abattoirs before the, before the big floods. You take that, then you turn around. Don't make eye contact. Come on. Come on. Quick. Come on, Bully. Quick. Come on, Bully. Come on. Hey, there Good we go. Good boy. And see, then we'd shut. Good lad. We won't do it now. I just really think we've got to concentrate on getting him comfortable, happy in yeah. here, relaxed, so he doesn't think that this is a trap. You watch, he'll turn around now and, and take off. Yeah, see? Let's go on. Chris will now give Bully 24 hours to get used to the yards. I need him to feel comfortable in this space because when it comes to giving him that anaesthetic, if he is on edge, if he's looking to escape, he's going to need such a high level of drugs that that becomes dangerous. You know, one of the great things about being in a place like Cairns is the Bush Telegraph, and let me just say, it is alive and well. While Chris lets Bully adjust to his new feeding yard, there's no downtime for the visiting vet. You go and see one bull and it seems like someone tells someone that needs help. So now I'm getting involved in what sounds like a pretty serious local epidemic. How are you going? Hi Chris, how, how are, are you? you? It's Jenny, isn't it? Yes it is. I I'll shake your hand but I've got my hands full I, at the moment. I can see that. It's great that you're here because we really can do with some extra help. When everyone imagines the Great Barrier Reef up here, they think of this really fertile area that's full of coral and, and surely full of food. But for turtles, after the Cyclone Yasi came through, all that seagrass that turtles normally eat got covered in silt. It's died off, and for turtles, there's no food anymore. Survival for these turtles depends on rehabilitation centres like this one, which is funded entirely by donations. It's really sad to see it because they're such an incredible animal. I mean, these animals have survived millions of years, and now with what's happening, they're starving and they're dying in huge numbers. Do we know where this one's coming from? This one's coming down from Port Douglas. Yep. Jenny and the team here are already at full capacity, but it's a measure of how significant the problem is. They've got another turtle coming in right now. It just never seems to end. Oh, slappy, are you? Huh? A bit feisty. <laughs> She's feisty. <laughs> Since she got a tag. She has. I'll just check the number. So K47. Chris took her out and went, oh no, this is Nelly. What are you doing back in here? Those little papillomas, they look like little warts almost. What we do know about these fibro papillomas is that they're caused by stress. If they're out there and there's not enough food and they start to starve, the immune system crashes and these lumps just take over their body. If she's got these on the outside, then there is going to be a risk that she actually has them internally as well, isn't there? Yes, and that's the problem. If they have them internally, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do for them. The only way of knowing whether Nelly has any of these fibropapillomas inside of her is with a CT scan. Now, not many vet clinics around here have them, but thankfully, there's an imaging centre, a human one, that might just fit Nelly in. Go on, go. You're coming with me. Chris is now transporting Nelly to the Cairns Diagnostic Imaging Centre. The CT scan is being donated free of charge. It's a big moment, isn't it? All right, there's no fingers crossed in there. My fingers crossed. When we take this image of Nelly, if we find fibropapillomas inside of her, then the sad fact is she doesn't have a future. You have a big look inside you now. All right, good luck, huh? In Cairns, Nelly the turtle is about to undergo a CT scan to find out whether she's suffering from the deadly internal fibro papillomas. What we're looking for here are any little lumps 
on any of those intestines or any of the other internal organs like the liver. If we see lumps, it's a very bad sign. Now the liver looks good, intestinal walls are nice and smooth, spleen up here is great. It looks pretty good. So you're happy? It looks like it should. That's just like, great. Just like the textbooks. It's good news for Nelly. Yeah. Really the only issue with Nelly right now are these external lumps and the great thing about those is we can cut those off. The operation will be performed at the Marlin Coast Veterinary Hospital. It will be a delicate procedure. You're right, Nelly. That's we'll just awesome. check your breathing. You're going okay. Good girl. This is local anaesthetic, so we'll inject this underneath the lumps. Papillomaviruses, they actually grow big, and what happens is their joints become immovable, so it really is a very important operation that's been done today. Chris is using an electronic current to burn off the tumours. The electrocauterisation helps minimise any bleeding. Key here is just to be a little bit speedy, but be precise, because the first sign of distress, it's over. All right, now, last one, that's it. Well done, girl. Pretty happy with that, Jan. You've got a pretty good range of movement now, and I mean, to have 20 off, it's going to make a pretty big difference. It will make a huge difference to her, actually. That's great. Good girl. And you think this is a wild animal, and she's come in, she's been operated on, she's just done really, really well. Well, Nell, you're a lot less lumpy. Huh? Look at that. You reckon? Looks pretty good to me. I'm going to let you go home with Jen now. Oh, this is where Dr Chris lives. Oh, hi there. Hello. We were wondering if Dr Chris is in at all. Um, I'm really sorry he's not actually here today. Um, Back in English. Bondi, a family Sam have arrived hoping to Dr. meet Chris, their favourite oh, come along way just We get somebody in just about every day coming in to see Dr Chris. They want a photo, they want an autograph, and he just can't be here all the time. Now wait for a minute, let me just sort something out. I think we might be able to find a looky-likey for him. Ooh, OK, thanks so much. Finally, Neil knows what to do with that cardboard cutout. Oh, oh wow! He's much bigger in the real life. Oh. Do you think you might want to have a photo with Cardboard Chris? Jeez. He didn't mind. I don't think he knew the difference at all. He looks very handsome, doesn't he? He doesn't say a lot. Mummy likes a man who doesn't say a lot. It's the actual perfect use for Dr Chris. Cardboard Chris. All right, thanks so much, That's Neil. all right. I'm sorry the real Dr Chris isn't here. <laughs> I've been trying to get Chris out of the closet the whole time, but it's the cupboard under the stairs that'll have to do. In you go. That's it. Close it. Bang shut. Say bye bye. Oh wow, we have a crowd. A huge crowd has turned out to see whether Chris can remove the horn that's pushing into Bully's brain and threatening his life. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. No pressure. The whole neighbourhood has turned out to make sure the kid from the big city looks after their boy. It's coming, Bully. It's we'll coming. It I couldn't sleep last night because I thought if this doesn't work today, what are we going to do? You know, where do we go from here? You know, the next thing would be euthanasia because you know, he couldn't couldn't live like that. I reckon the plan of attack should be get his favourite food, lead him into the yard. I have the syringe in my hand, walk up around to his neck there, little pat, jab, and then out. It's OK, Bully. It's OK, buddy. It's all right. The thing that worries me the most about Bully is the fact that he's a Brahmin. Now, this breed is notorious for not liking to be in confined spaces. Add an injection to that, and he could quite likely try to climb out of the yard. If I'm in the way, he could go over the top of me. Well done, Chris. He's moved just after I've, I've injected and, and bent the needle, but I'm pretty sure it's all gone in there. The sedation appears to be working, but Chris has to be sure. The rather sobering reality is the fact that Bully could need another injection. Now he's seen me do one of them. The second one, so much harder. This time, Chris is using a dart pole to inject the drug. It's OK, mate. It's all right. That's gone in, and as he's tried to kick me, it's bent the needle, but the important thing is all that drug actually got into the muscle. 
until it's over and he's back on his feet, then we're a bit nervous. Yeah, it's human nature. He means a lot to us. Hey, buddy. You sleeping enough yet? Bully is finally asleep, and Chris can get on with the job of removing the horn that's growing into the side of his head. There we go. Oh, boy, not much longer, buddy. OTM, over the moon. <laughs> yeah. It's just such a relief. Such a relief. Yeah, look here. Well done. You actually see where the horn's been pressing in. It's been a constant migraine for him. And it's probably bored him. Another 10 years of life. It's great. You've done a great job. Congratulations. It's a hot day. He's had a lot of anaesthetic drug into his system. It's going to take a long time to wake up. In all that time, he's lost that ability to, to cool down. So he needs extra help. We're gonna call them the big guns. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Steady, bully. Steady. Steady. That's great. We can get him standing up in the next hour or so. I'll be happy. We did it. <laughs> While Karen keeps an eye on Bully, Chris now has time to check up on his other very important patient. I heard you're renowned for liking squid. Nellie, the green turtle that was found starving to death on a beach, is recovering from the surgery to remove her tumours. You like it, huh? Well, we've got a bit more. You just can't get enough, and that's, that's a really great sign. There's no doubt that these turtles have the odds stacked right against them, but thankfully rescue centres like this do exist. You just have to believe that you can make a difference, and Nellie should be the perfect example of that in the way that she came in, in such a bad way. But hopefully in a few months time, she does get released back to the wild and that should be where she stays. You've slept it off surely, haven't you? Two hours later, and Chris is back to see where the bully has recovered from his major procedure. Come on, bully. Come on, bully. Big stretch, Go, bully. big stretch. Go, bully. Go, bully. Oh, Yay. you're an athlete. You are an athlete. <laughs> Oh, Bully's up and up and away. This no! one's for you, Bully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might just make a toast to all the Matron's Beach community here who have taken a rather flirtatious Bullock under their wing and shown him a lot of love. The really amazing thing for me is that the people up here, they're surrounded by this incredible beauty of the Great Barrier Reef and these long sandy beaches with palm trees, but the real beauty here is within these people. And I love that shot of these animals, these battlers like Bully. It's pretty special. Thank you and cheers. Cheers, cheers boy. Just had a desperate call from a lady who's really worried about a puppy who's just unable to use a leg, so I'm trying to get there as soon as I can. Hi Chris, come in. Thank you. You're Sheena? Yes, Sheena. Nice to meet you. You too. This is Munro and this is Millie. Okay. Which is the one with the problem? Um, Munro. I just want to see how she goes here with her sister. Come on, guys. Here. Here. She's unable to take more than a few steps and then just falls to the ground. Her legs fall apart. She's very tired. She gets breathless easily. Come on, quick. Puppy, come. Come on. She's trying. You look in those eyes and she's incredibly frustrated because she wants to be a puppy, but she can't because she can't move. Come on. Manro, come. Come on. Come. Good girl. Good girl. You expect that puppies are going to be a little bit clumsy, but you never see this situation where those legs just slip out from underneath them and they collapse. The concern I've got is that if she can't support her weight when she's five weeks old and weighs, you know, a couple of kilos, uh -huh. what hope does she have when she's 20 kilos? Chris has a suspicion about what's causing this severe condition. He's hoping he's wrong. You want to see a chest almost goes inwards. It's almost concave there. The big thing I notice is her chest. It feels flat. The sternum doesn't have any great point to it and her chest doesn't have any depth. And that's just the classic sign of swimming syndrome. 
This deformed chest cavity forces the puppy to lie flat, compressing its lungs, causing difficulty breathing and lethargy. It is almost like she's swimming. Yes. You just see her, her legs spreading out like this, like she's almost doing breaststroke. Yeah, it looks like she's swimming. This condition is pretty rare. A lot of vets go through their entire career having never seen a case of it. Come on, Rev. Come on, one. Come on. I've heard most people put these dogs down. Um, I couldn't do that. I'm just hoping that he can help her. Come on, Munro, come on. 50 per cent of puppies that have this, that aren't helped out, will die. We need to actually act fairly quickly on this, because if we don't do anything, then this will be her. Yeah. And it's not much of a life. No, it isn't. Can I get a hand? This owner's just brought in this cat. The face is swollen, she's brought in a brown snake as well. We've got puncture wounds all over the snake. At the Bondi Referral Hospital Sash, four-year-old Nemo has been rushed in after being attacked by a snake. His little heart's racing. Brown snakes are probably one of the most dangerous snakes in Australia. They cause paralysis, they cause internal bleeding. They really are a very venomous snake. That face is really, really swollen. He's definitely been bitten. I think the fact that he's alive is actually quite lucky because with the brown snake, they kill within 30 minutes. Owner Jenny and her daughter Ellie managed to catch the badly injured snake. It's quite freaky putting the... Well, she did all the hard work. Putting my daughter's life on the line, putting the snake in a box. I've never seen a brown snake with a tail like that. So thin at the end. So tiny. You know, Jenny says that this is a brown snake, but I'm not 100% convinced. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to get a second opinion. Nemo's attacker must be correctly identified so the right treatment can be given. So if I just pick him up behind the head with these? Yeah, just you, you and me, we're real snake lovers here, oh, so yeah. it's just... <laughs> All right, Vic, hold this head up. <laughs> oh, the tongue came out. How's that for profile? That's great. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give Tim, our snake expert, a call and show him a picture of the snake and see if he can solve this mystery for us. If it is a brown snake, we have to get anti venine into Nemo as soon as we can because if we wait, that could threaten his life. Millie? Millie first. At the Bondi Clinic, Worried owner Sheena has arrived with five-week-old sisters Munro and Millie. And what about you? OK, so she's a little bit smaller, which we'd expect given the fact she's had, I guess, this slower start to life. Exactly. Little Munro is unable to walk, and Chris is worried she may be suffering a rare condition known as swimmer syndrome. I know you just want to sleep, but we do need to see how you get around. OK? It's so obvious just how much of a difference there is between these two puppies. Not only is Munro 10% lighter in weight compared to Millie, but you look at her and there's just no energy there. She'll be playing all the time, having a little cat nap up again playing, but she just doesn't want to participate. Now, Munro, your sister's going to take the hit first up, all right? Chris will compare x-rays of the puppies to confirm how severely affected Munro is by swimmer syndrome. My feeling is that Munro's is going to be quite significantly flattened and compressed and that's why she's having trouble getting around, that's why she's having trouble breathing and could explain everything that we're seeing. If you look at Millie's x-ray, yeah, see, there you go. So that the sternum's come further down and it's also at more of an angle. So if you flick between the two, then you go to Munro's, it's higher and flatter. And that's the classic sign of swimmer syndrome. Because so many of these puppies are put down, there's no clear designated way to fix these guys. So we have to be a little bit creative, we have to come up with our own way of fixing her. For her treatment, the first thing I want you to do is some physio, to squeeze her chest mm -hmm. on either side to force that sternum forward. Mm -hmm. She also learns how to support weight on those back legs too. Mm -hmm. What makes this so different to any other challenge I've faced with a dog before is, this isn't teaching a dog to walk again. This is teaching a dog to walk for the first time. I just don't like to see her in pain. But, um, well, nobody does, but, yeah, we have to do these things to help her. I guess we have to realise here that 
There are no guarantees that what we're going to do with Munro is going to make a difference, but you have to try. Because if you don't, she's going to be locked in that splayed position for life, and that's not a life. His tail goes like right, you know, skinny down to nothing. At SASH, Lisa's calling snake expert Tim Faulkner from the Australian Reptile Park. He's got like a white little spot in the front bit of his eye. He's been sent a photo of the snake that attacked Nemo, and Lisa's hoping he can identify it. You know I'm not very good with snakes, Tim. What do you think? In reception, owners Jenny and Ali are waiting anxiously for the answer to that question. I don't want to hear bad news. <laughs> These cats are very much a part of the family, aren't they? If it is a deadly brown snake, then Nemo's brother Oscar could be about to lose his best mate. Yeah, there's definitely white markings on his face. OK, Tim. Awesome. Thank you so much for your help. It's a whip snake, so whip snakes are not as venomous as brown snakes. They're not that. deadly, which is excellent. Um, he's really, really, really lucky. Happy on a trip, buddy. There's no anti-venine for the whip snake. It does cause a local reaction, which is pretty uncomfortable. We do have to support him, put him on a drip, give him some anti-inflammatories and antihistamine. Tiny sting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's turning. He says, I don't like it at all. He's had fangs in his face and he's jumping off the table with me giving him two small injections. I think he's had one prick too many today. In you go. While Nemo's treatment takes effect, Lisa turns her attention to the perpetrator. Nemo has had a good go at this little one. As a vet, it's our duty to treat all animals and to treat all wildlife and this little snake He's actually been injured as well. He's a patient too, so now we actually have to assess the snake. I think it's worthwhile taking an X-ray of him and see if there's anything that we can fix. It looks here like he's got a dislocated spine. The kindest thing to do is to put him to sleep. So Nemo's around here. So you can give him a cuddle. Hello, Nemo. Fortunately, Nemo is going to survive. We'll come back and get you tomorrow, OK? Best possible outcome, although I'm sure that Nemo is going to be not very happy spending the night away from home. He's the biggest baby, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> Next day, Chris is scheduled to start therapy on Little Munro. You're good girls. But first, he's responding to an intriguing SOS. I don't know if this is a joke or not, but I've just had a call to a family that has been bailed up in their house by a lizard. I don't know how big the lizard it is, what sort of lizard it is, even if it is a lizard, it could be a snake. But we've got to get there, help out the family, and try and end this standoff. Glenn, is it? Glenn, yeah. All right, I'm Chris, this is Barry. Oh, nice to meet you. Yeah. You too. What have we got here? Uh, we were a bit worried. We didn't know what it was. We didn't want to get bitten or anything like that. So we thought we'd better bring the professionals and get them to come out and have a look at us. As Chris and wildlife expert Barry try to corral the home intruder, they're relieved to find out they're hunting a water dragon and not a snake. Water dragons generally aren't dangerous, except when they're threatened they're cornered, then they will try and strike out with their claws or they can not even inflict a bit of a bite. In that case, I'll be turning the camera off straight away, obviously mopping up the blood and pretending that never happened. You hot, Barry? It's hot in here, it's isn't warm, it? It's warm, isn't it? OK. Everybody, just think of a nice, cool, calm little stream, pond, calm, relaxing music. Ignore the big hand that's about to come in. Probably the only concern is the fact that he's, he's pretty placid. He didn't put up much of a fight there, which, you know, in the short term is a good thing, but, but long term you want him to be actually pretty feisty, because that usually implies that he's, he's healthy. I want to thank your, um, your landlords for the hospitality. Can we say goodbye? Yes, they are. Bye. It's a built-up environment. We've got dogs, we've got people, we've got cars. That's not safe for him to be around. We'll take him back to the clinic and give him a good once-over and, and really make sure he's ready to be released. And if he is, 
then I've got the perfect spot in mind. See you later. See you later, mate. All right, so it's a, um, it's a brown snake. Oh, OK. Yeah. Stick your hand in, go for it. That's a Bondi clinic. Chris is attempting to scare <laughs> vet nurse Liesl. Ah! But she's just not biting. No, I'm glad. Really. Cute animal in the line. Yeah, of course. It's beautiful. It does have little teeth. Massive tongue. Good <laughs> that? Don't know if you're his type. <laughs> Do you can just play it slow first of all? I think so. Maybe dinner first. <laughs> I'm looking for a few things here. Most importantly, the, the gum colour. I want to make sure that he's nice and pink. That just tells me that his circulation's working well and that he's, he's, he's got enough nutrients. You can tell a lot about his level of hydration too. If he's lacking in saliva or if his saliva's very dry and tacky, then he's going to be really dehydrated. Whereas here, he's got quite a bit of saliva floating around. Um, and if... Um, that really hurts. Really hurts. That's all right. It was the tongue thing, wasn't it? It was the kiss. <laughs> um, his teeth are fine. They're working really well, actually. Really well. So that, that reassures me that everything's going to be OK. <laughs> that really hurts. Probably sticking your finger inside a water dragon's mouth isn't the best idea. Maybe if you come across one at home, don't do that. I know you can hear the water, but that's not your kind of water. It's salty. The water dragon's been given a clean bill of health and Chris is now very happy to release him. Don't mind it, huh? Can you hear the other guys? The snappy the lizard's new address is prime leafy real estate close to the harbour. Our time together must come to an end. <laughs> this will be perfect for him. It's really his all-you-can-eat buffet. And we know he can eat. He eats very well. Shake hands and apologise. Seems pretty content. Sheena? Hi Chris, how are you? Good, how are you? You're off to the beach. No, there's a purpose behind this. You'll really? find out, yeah. After a quick costume change, Chris is stopping at Sheena's house to try out an invention in which he hopes will help Munro walk. Look, it's a present for you. Look at oh, this. Oh, this looks nice. Okay. <laughs> nice. Munro's about to experience the next part of the therapy. This has a plaster mould inside it. Mm -hmm. This actually means that her chest can't lie flat. Okay. So it's like a big V there. This will actually push the weight out to the side of a chest. Yep. And in a way, do what we were trying to do before. With the exercises. With the exercises. Great. Look at this. It's a new wardrobe. Millie will be jealous. Hopefully that sternum of hers will actually grow outwards and let her lungs really expand. She's all bound up like a leg of lamb at the moment. <laughs> oh, that's it! <laughs> I'm not too sure about this. She does look like a leg of lamb. We're not in the greatest terms right now, are we? This is one of those ideas I had swimming around in my head. It, I should have pointed out it wasn't a finished idea. It's like a little G-string. <laughs> it was my intention <laughs> to make your dog a G-string. But yes, it does look like a G-string, right? My invention's taken a few little adjustments, but in the end, it's doing its job. Good girl. Oh, it's good, good girl. girl. Good. Great. Hey, look at you go. Wow. Monroe is only five weeks of age, so in the best case scenario, she'd only need to have this harness on for about three weeks until her chest is reshaped, she can get more air into her lungs, learn to walk properly, then the harness will be a thing of the past. That was a good trip. <laughs> There's just one more component to Munro's full body workout. After all, what's the best exercise for a swimmer? That's very good. See, she's running. Good girl! She's essentially running there. The movement of swimming for a dog is exactly the same as the movement of walking. She's motoring. I mean, she's never moved those legs this fast ever before. This is the only swim school in Australia where dog paddle is actually not only allowed but encouraged. If there was ever any doubt, this just proves that those back legs, they work. They work perfectly well. They just need to know how. This is teaching her how. I never expected to see her swim. I thought she um, would just cry a lot, but she actually swam, which is fantastic. Those legs work. Look at you go, huh? Look at you. 
The water therapy is already making a difference, but there are still no guarantees Munro will ever be able to walk like normally. Final instructions, exercises, funky new outfit, aqua aerobics. <laughs> you got it? You do that, you might be okay. I really think between the family's commitment and little Munro's determination, this is a team that deserves to succeed. So you just hope they will. Are you talking today? My beautiful boy. It's been 24 hours since Nemo was attacked by a whip snake. Nemo is so much better today. He's got over this nice and quickly. Yeah, he's done really, really well. He's very lucky that it wasn't a brown snake. Good boy, Nemo. It's quite tense yesterday. Miss Brave here, who said that she would be okay when we got home, was she wouldn't leave the other cat alone. Yeah, I missed him. Oh, there he is. You can grab him out and give him a cuddle. Look at your leg. Oh. <laughs> Look at your legs. He looks so much better, doesn't oh, yeah. he? This is really lucky for Nemo because he came in with the suspected brown snake bite, went home 24 hours later just with some swelling on his face from a whip snake. Could have been a lot worse. See you later. Thanks. No bye. more snakes, little one. Hey, we don't want to see you again here. You say bye bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Here he comes. Woo! Hello. <laughs> run, girls, run, run. Oh, look, he's at the front. Hey, our swimmer got a land legs back, huh? Happy as Larry. It's three weeks since Munro's therapy began and the little Staffy has made an amazing recovery. This is part of the physio now, is it? Yep. Munro's caught up and she looks fantastic. Everything about her screams out, normal puppy. I think it's pretty safe to say she's making up for lost time right now. Oh, she's full of life. Yeah, she does everything the other one does. If you didn't know anything was wrong with her, you would never know that there was something wrong with her. Incredible transformation over just a few weeks to see it go from just being a really sad little girl to watch to now being so happy in every step she makes. And a lot of people were saying that Munro didn't have a life to lead, but we took a chance and you can see today it was a chance worth taking. You've cured a swimmer puppy. <laughs> How good does that feel? <laughs> if you guys loved that video, great. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel below. That way.